Okay, it is 6 p.m. September 15, 2014, and time to get this regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of the San Felipe Del Rio CISD underway. I count six trustees in attendance. Dr. Keyes is absent. We do have a quorum, correct, Mr. Overfeld? Yes, sir. Let the record show that a quorum of the board members are present, that this meeting has been duly called, and notice that this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. At this time, if you'd stand for opening ceremonies. First, a moment of silence. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Well, we are in the open meeting portion. If you look on your agenda for tonight, we have no recognitions or public hearings, so that brings us to agenda item six, board members report. I just wanted to reiterate what I think all the board knows. A couple of months ago, uh, this board uh, voted to nominate Mr. Raymond Mesa to serve on the Texas Association of School Board Board of Directors as a Region 15 representative. Uh, we were notified a few weeks ago, I think a couple weeks ago, that um, the other individual, I guess, that was going to run did not run. And Mr. Mesa is successful, will be uh, officially installed, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, at the TASA TASBE convention as uh, along after the delegate assembly. Is that how it works, Mr. Mesa? Yes. So um, I know I certainly speak for everyone when I say congratulations, Mr. Mesa. We're certainly looking forward to the good work you're going to do. If, if you'd like to take a couple minutes, maybe, and tell us a little bit about that role and um, what you expect. Sure. You know, as a retired principal, we always have something to say. You know, you give us a mic and we won't stop. It's a three-year commitment, um, but I think it's a very challenging commitment. I don't know in the history of this school district if anyone so. has ever done that before. Oh, but. Uh, you get to represent Region 15, and so uh, we make decisions that will create policy that will go into effect um, for the coming years. Uh, what we do is uh, we communicate and collaborate with representatives from the different districts in Region 15 and come up with suggestions for policy change um, in areas that might be a concern for some districts. Uh, as, as you know, sometimes uh, the federal government treats districts as if they were all the same, and all of us have unique um, things, you know, uh, sometimes concerns that are brought up, and uh, I'll just bring up one, for example. We compete with UIL, and we travel long distances, and so we spend a lot of money there. Um, whereas San Antonio and other larger districts do not have to spend the night like we do and, and have buses, you know, take children 150 miles away. And so uh, these concerns are brought up and, and, and so to sort of treat the districts in a fair manner, uh, we bring up those concerns so that uh, hopefully it, it will be taken like a federal relations uh, network where representatives and, and congressional people can hear our voices and then finally uh, changes be made. But um, it is a big commitment and, and I'm, I'm glad to serve. Thank you. Congratulations again and I, I believe that the board actually meets after the delegate assembly. Is that how that works? And I know Mr. Chavita is the alternate or will be the delegate or you're still the delegate or uh, how does... My understanding is it will not conflict. Um, I will be the delegate and then after that, uh, that's when I get installed. Okay. And of course, Mr. Tavita, you're still the alternate delegate to the assembly, so yeah. 
work into it. And um, we actually have four meetings throughout the year, so it's not not too too bad. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for informing us and serving. Okay, that brings us to agenda item seven. There's nothing on the agenda, so that brings us to agenda item eight, the consent agenda. You take a minute and look through that. You'll notice that there are these, are, of course, consent are the items that are routine or of a regular nature that come back. There are the minutes for approval, and then there are uh, the awards, uh, contracts. There's also a, a few purchase orders. And as always, when we act on it, uh, one motion will, uh, will, will approve all of them. So if anyone wants something pulled, I actually have a couple questions. I don't know that we need to pull it formally. I think the questions can be dispensed with pretty quickly. If someone would indulge me, I think the first question is for Mr. Salinas under F1, the consideration to approve the PO over 25000 with Amistad Heating and Air Conditioning. I think you're the person who can answer my questions. I noticed on the, uh, on the memo, the attached memo, and it was really just for clarification, on my point, uh, I understand what we're doing, installing 28 tons of heating and air conditioning uh, to the first floor and second floor dressing rooms of Old Delrio High School. It says the dressing rooms presently only have heating and fans to circulate the air, correct? Yes. But no air conditioning. Clarification, the uh, coaches offices were tied into the uh, chiller system a while back, but they're not working, so okay. those, those units would be replaced. Okay. The other question, and jump in if you need to, I'm just, like I said, I didn't want to pull them for discussion, is under G6, and that's for Dr. Patty McManera. It's the consideration to approve a contract with TASB for the employee climate survey, which I think traditionally we've done in March. Um, according to the memo on 104, you could answer this for me. 104, unless I, perhaps I missed something, I guess that's what I'm asking. The memo says, okay. it gives us a breakdown for the survey and the reports. Now we've done this, uh, this will be the third time as part of the planning process and the identification of areas to improve. But it says on this memo, details about the survey process and the sample survey instrument are included in the attached proposal. But all I saw was the actual agreement. So did I miss something? No, just the agreement was in there. The um, uh, sample survey was included last year. Okay. All right. And there's been no substantial changes. I think the survey's a pretty standard form. It's exactly the same. Exactly yes, the sir. same. And it'll be uh, that week after spring break, just as we did it this year. Right, which takes us through about three-fourths of the year and a yes, better sir. way to gauge people's ideas and attitudes. Yes, sir. And then the results of those go into the campus improvement plans, correct? Yes, I mean, they're, they inform the process in some way? Correct. Okay. One last question. Under G1, I guess this is for Ms. Garcia, the contract for Dr. Cantu. Now, I know Dr. Cantu has consulted before. This is on page 99. The memo apparently is on page 99. I know he's consulted before in a similar, exact same capacity. Um, but I think the last time he did, it was kind of at the tail end of his, of his service. Looking at that contract, it, it talks about the... Uh, the things that he reports on as far as the work with the staff, does the board get uh, periodic reports of his findings and his recommendations? I don't think we've given them to the board in the past. Now we certainly can because they're entity-related reports on a reporting right. basis. And the reason I'm asking because I remember the last time, but I think it was at the towards the end of his consulting service, so I didn't know if there had been reports, especially about his findings regarding assessment or staff development and curriculum and instruction alignment and things like that. So he, he does provide reports, I guess, in the follow-ups because the contract specific 
about the number of days he's here and the interaction. I just didn't remember if the board had ever seen those results. Okay. That's all I had. If anyone has a question about something, Mr. Mesa, a question on something on the consent? Um, I guess Mr. Casillas, G5. Just wanted to know, um, the unit to call manager system, could you elaborate on that? So um, I noticed that uh, there's a lot of database that's going to be deleted from the Unity uh, from that system, from what I read in page 103. We're going to update it because we have over 1,700 new phones or phones on the system, and uh, the new phone system that we have uses a different licensing. So we've got licenses in there from about 10 years ago that need to be updated. And So this is for mass calling, like students throughout the, the school no, district. No, no, this is just for the the calling system that we use within the district. All of those IP phones that we have. Oh, okay. So that's communication within the district. That's correct. Okay. Dr. Rios has a comment. If I can give an example, Mr. Mesa, when uh, when a parent receives a call from a campus, or when they used to receive a call from a campus, it would always show one common number. So if a parent has a child at Buena Vista, another two at the high school, and a fourth child at Del Rio Middle School, sounds awfully familiar, uh, and you get that call, you won't know which child called you because it shows one common number. So what they installed this year was a system where it's individual numbers that go out, and you'll know exactly what number called you. So when you, if you just hit to return the call, it'll go specifically to where you receive that number. Now the next step of that is do what he said is create that menu for each campus so when you call back you can trace back uh, I'm sorry have a selection where you're guided within that campus in English and Spanish okay just trying to prove our customer service okay that's all I have Mr. Chavita I don't have any problem I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Casillas for you know all the uh, work uh, that you've done to enhance our technology program I talked to him today, and uh, of course, you, I need to advise him first to tone down everything, but to my understanding. But thank you, Mr. Casillas. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Anything else on the consent for clarification? Or are you okay on the consent? Okay. All right. Since we're through asking questions of the consent agenda, is there a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda? Ms. Lozano has motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion carries. And in the consent agenda were, I believe, 14 enumerated donations. And as is the custom and, I believe, policy, at this time we'll take a few moments to publicly recognize and thank those groups and individuals that made donations to the district and to our students. Is there a trustee who would like to do the honors? Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Overfill. Okay. Del Rio Cross Country Booster Club, $1,495.59 to the Del Rio High School Cross Country uh, team. And then the <coughs> following are all to the Delroy Middle School Palm Squad. Uh, Arts Mesquite Source, $300. G's Jewelry and More, $50. J's Beauty and Barbershop, $100. Juanita C. Torres, $50. Maria De Brule, $50. PNN Collins LLC, $100. Ricardo Cervantes Jr., $50. Ross Emporium, $40. Rosie's Jewelry, $50. 
Sirloin Stockade, $50, and Spinks Insurance Agency, $20. Again, all the leaves to the Del Rio High, or sorry, the Del Rio Middle School Palm Squad. Non-monetary donations from Sigmatron International Incorporated, one auto splice and one universal uh, GSM dual beam valued at $600 to the Del Rio High School welding program, and then from Dell, a non-monetary donation <coughs> of the target safety cases for the Dell High School uh, one to one initiative valued at $36 each for a total of $7,200. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Overfelt, and of course, thank you to all those individuals, groups, uh, that made donations to the district on behalf of the students. We certainly appreciate it. That brings us to agenda item nine, citizens to be heard. Ms. Falcone, no one signed up. That brings us to agenda item 10, which is about halfway through tonight's agenda. <laughs> In 20 minutes. You never know. You could slow down. I'm not slow down, Mr. Oldest. <laughs> Agenda item 10, excuse me, administration. A, consideration to approve the 2014-2015 superintendent performance goals. Uh, you're aware, of course, of the calendar that the board uh, uses to stay on track, so to speak, about uh, the evaluation of the superintendent and district improvement in general, and uh, last month, Dr. Rios had presented a rough draft, just for kind of reiteration or for awareness. Um, this month, uh, to, we do uh, think that we approve them or ask for more work to be on, done on them. It's part of a multi-step process. Remember, performance goals are or should be specific, measurable, uh, certainly attainable, relevant, and timely. And in kind of the large scheme of evaluations generally, there are a handful of, of things, kind of significant accomplishments that uh, the board and the superintendent think need to occur within a certain span of time, in this case within a year. It's not the evaluation per se, it is a component of the evaluation. And at at this point, we're kind of looking at where the superintendent is, is heading. So I know you provided something in the uh, board update. I don't know if there was further uh, discussion or refinement or whatever. So do you want to speak to what you're proposing uh, for us to discuss or approve or table until a later time? Or the, um, the goals that presented to y'all last week that there was a minor a couple minor changes um, I, I don't know uh, how much in depth I'm prepared to go uh, into as much detail as, as y'all deem necessary but really what I want to share with y'all is that the first goal uh, has to do with teaching and learning the, the, the instruction in a safe environment and I would share with y'all that um, they haven't changed very much because even though there's going to be specific activities that, that happen, uh, and I've alluded to some of them here, the goal is still to build the skill set of the teachers uh, continuously. Um, and how we do that, well, that's where we get into the details. Uh, for example, and I can have Ms. Garcia uh, call up the system and show you. So, for example, if we look at the bottom bullet on the superintendent's performance goals. Yeah, hold on. Can, is there a way to display this on the screen? Not this, but the... the um, for example, I was going to descri describe the instructional technology okay. uh, to include the uh, electronic curriculum, and that's what I was going to okay. uh, have them call up if, if, uh, if it's okay, Ms. Garcia. Yes, and I'm going to call Ms. Solis up because she's been spearheading the SharePoint curriculum portal, so she's going to navigate the system okay. for us. Is that the only copy you have of um, that? Um, I thought they were in the agenda. If they're not, can you... Um, can we get copies of this real quick? So we can Betty call it? No, they weren't in the packet. That's why I'm wondering. You mentioned you had made some <coughs> adjustments since. I'm sorry, I provided on the board update. Right. That was after the packet went out. We'll just.
pause for a moment while we get coffees. Well, I think that I think that I can continue with okay. with the. If, so, what, if you'll hold on there for a second, what we did um, over the summer uh, as a response, really a couple of things. One, uh, Mr. Mesa, you had me. Uh, you encouraged me to review the curriculum website that one of the districts in San Antonio had. Uh, that coupled with an experience that our team who went to Vail, Arizona, came back and talked, led to the formation of our uh, curriculum repository, electronic. And this is the next step of developing the curriculum. If you know that a couple of years ago they did away with Cisco. Uh, so what we've done is we put together a curriculum portal that will house uh, the curriculum documents, the assessment, and resources for the teachers. Last year we heard a lot of the, the missing resources, so if you can take it from there and, and give them a brief synopsis of it. Um, good evening, everyone. I just want to navigate through the curriculum portal so that you can kind of take a look at what our teachers have access to as they go through the planning protocol uh, within their um, instructional setting. And so really you'll get to see how the contents are listed up at the top. You'll also get to see that once I click on a content, it takes me straight to a grade level. And from the grade level, I can specify whether I want to go to a particular six weeks. And so right now, we're currently um, uploading first six weeks documents have been uploaded and second six weeks are in the process. So if I just click on fifth grade math, for example, this will take me to any yearly documents. And so you'll see that we have um, our year at a glance. And as I just click on it here, um, as teachers are planning, if they've got that uh, technology component in front of them, they're able to pull these up. And most of our teachers have an interactive whiteboard where they can display this information. And so this is our year at a glance. Our TEKS resource system does allow us um, to view this document. But we at the district um, do allow our teachers to have some very important input as to how they teach these particular concepts. And so for the first six weeks alone, um, and I can probably try to zoom in here just to that first six weeks, You'll notice that there are three different units that are taught in fifth grade math. Unit one and unit two um, are part of this particular um, year at a glance, but our teachers, um, through their input, were able to say that they really wanted to introduce unit four during the first six weeks, and so this is one of the changes that they did make. Um, we do color code these so that you see the readiness and supporting standards, and that's where you see the red and the green. Um, and then more importantly, you can see how um, we put together the categories based on how they're assessed in the STAR assessment. So this is just a sample of the year at a glance. Um, as we continue looking through our curriculum documents, of course, you've got your TEKS verification document where you can see all of the TEKS listed and how they are taught throughout the year. Um, that's a document that our teachers refer to quite often. And then one of the biggest components that we introduced this year is what we call our roadmap. And a lot of our teachers have talked about wanting to see um, a collaborative approach to the way we teach each individual content. And so this roadmap was developed by our teachers this summer during curriculum review. They basically stated all of the readiness and supporting standards, and they basically gave a timeline as to when and approximately they wanted to teach these um, particular concepts. And so you'll see that in math, um, week one, there are two supporting standards that they cover. It does not mean that those are the only two standards that they teach. Um, they definitely embed the process standards and anything else that they feel is appropriate. Um, but more importantly, just to see that connection across all seven of our elementary campuses, um, more or less if you were to walk into a fifth grade uh, math class, these are this is what you would see them instructing on week one. And so there is a connection to the way the year at a glance is set up and the TVD. Um, if we continue kind of looking, I'm just going to navigate through several different grade levels. And so um, looking at the next part, I want to take you to our first six weeks documents. And so this is what our teachers get to see. They get to see a scope and sequence. They get to see an assessment. They get to see a lesson plan component, the resources, and any multimedia device. Um, I can tell you that since we started working on this, it is definitely a work in progress, and we hope to see this um, full-blown by the end of this year. But we are adding the components as, as we go through this process. So just clicking on the assessment very quickly, we start with the end in mind here in this district. We want to make sure that we know what's being assessed, and so we're able to, um, to teach our content based on that end in mind approach. And so if I just quickly click on the assessment, this is what our fifth grade math first six weeks assessment looks like. Um, this really drives our instruction and the way that we plan collaboratively through our planning protocol sessions. You'll also get to see the scope and sequence. And so again, taking your yearly documents, taking that roadmap, 
teachers over the summer came in and developed what we call our learning targets and guiding questions. And so these documents really just kind of specify what specifically will teachers be teaching during this particular time. And so just looking again at fifth grade math, uh, this unit is on extending whole numbers, unit one. The learning target is listed right here in the middle. I can explain how to find the square footage of a football field and it will take approximately three days. One of the biggest things that we talk about is not just identifying the big ideas and concepts, but really looking at the specificity. And so this document just kind of, kind of brings that together. There is academic vocabulary that is absolutely important for students to know um, and for them to be able to speak when teachers are delivering the lesson. And then, of course, we've got our guiding questions. And this is what promotes that rigor and the critical thinking within our documents. It's very important that teachers ask guiding questions that lead to that critical thinking for students. And so you may notice that they start off very basic and then they work their way up in rigor as you move down the line. We have our journal entries because we all know that when students write um, based on what they know, they're able to successfully tell us whether they've learned that process or not. And so it's very important that we incorporate those journal entries along with any kind of formative assessments. And so if I just click through these, you'll notice that the formative assessments change depending on the learning targets. There are different ways of assessing our kids on a daily check. Um, we also have our IFDs, and I just really want to quickly um, go over this document just because this is the instructional focus document. When teachers look at the year at a glance, the roadmap, and the assessment, they're able to look at the big ideas and concepts of what they teach. But more importantly, they have to really look at that specificity. What is it that they specifically need to teach? And so I just want to take you through one of the TEKS that really hones in on... Um, how specific teachers need to be when they teach some of these concepts. And this is why um, we really feel like the planning protocol and the way they collaborate on a daily basis um, is key to their success. If you're looking at this one here, 5.2a, it is a supporting standard, so you will find it on the STAR assessment. Um, but if you notice, all of this in the blue on this side is the specificity as to how deep they have to go. And so you'll notice that they um, cover whole numbers, decimals, um, digits, place values, and it really just keeps going down that document. And so for a new teacher, for example, who's looking at this document for the first time ever, um, if they don't have somebody collaborating with them, they may look at this and feel very overwhelmed as they start looking through their curriculum documents. So through the means of our cluster leaders and through the means of our instructional coaches, they're able to really just drive those conversations as they plan together. And then really just the last thing I want to go over is um, the way our resources are set up. And I'm just going to go to fourth grade math to show you another example. Um, here we have the lesson plans, and like I said, this is definitely a work in progress. <coughs> I'm sorry, I meant fourth grade science. Science, grade four, first six weeks. And I wanted to show you this lesson plan template because this one in particular um, gives you the active links. So thinking about uh, the goal number three for the superintendent's goals, uh, we talk about incorporating that technology. And so if a teacher were to say, well, really, I don't know how to go about uh, teaching the safety rules or being able to notebook at the beginning of the year, here is um, an exemplar lesson for fourth grade science. And this does not mean that the teacher has to take this lesson plan as a whole. This just means that as our resources develop, they'll have this option plus any other options that are listed in here. And so they very well could take the engagement piece and say, you know what, I can do that in my classroom. I'm going to um, use that in my lesson plans. Or they can take the whole thing and say, you know what, I really like the way this has panned out. And so they're going to take the whole lesson plan itself. Um, really quickly, you'll notice that there are active links. So as you click on the links, it takes you to um, open other items. In this case, here is a resource for teachers, how to um, incorporate science notebooking. And it literally gives them the table of contents, what grade level you are, and how to use this particular tool. And then, of course, the last thing is just as we look at the resources, here it's just listed. Um, and they're listed right now by just um, topic. We're looking at how better to list these. We kind of think that if we list them by TEKS, teachers will have a, be a better understanding of them. And so if I just click on this, for example, um, the matter brochure, here is one resource that can be utilized for teaching matter in fourth grade science. The idea behind that first bullet is that if, if we look at the goal as it was stated last year and how it's stated this year, we have to continue to facilitate 
the planning process and the skills of development, but without the appropriate resources, it's hard because then you're just talking in a vacuum. Now, this took a whole lot of work, and we're through the first six weeks, but we really have to push that work forward so the teachers have the resources. And that is, uh, by far, uh, one of the biggest goals that we have um, in, for this year in, in meeting the, the first goal. The second bullet is we move up. Now, at any time, just ask me questions as you have. So, so, uh, I have a question. Okay, so this is accessible, will be, or is, is accessible <coughs> from the website. So I, as a teacher, can go to the website and, and bring it up and sort through how many pages of that one document you pulled up, the, the last one you pulled up? The resource lesson plan page? Yes. I think well, the so. IFD was the, the, the last one, the one that was about science? Yes, I have, that's our lesson plan page, and it's uh, two pages. one you were asking about? Well, there was one that... I think it was the link here. Yeah. About, okay, hit the link. Uh-huh. It looks so overwhelming. Yeah, okay. That's, oh, you read well, my mind. 39. Oh, oh, okay. So, I'm a teacher. I have access to this curriculum database, loft. What's the word? <coughs> database, I guess. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. From From the web page. Um, it's an awful lot of information. I'm not saying <coughs> real good information or anything like that. So where do I, as a teacher, kind of get the <coughs> hands-on hand-holding to know where things are and how to access them? The planning protocol. Okay. Right. During, the, during the collaborative planning sessions that uh, they have as a whole. Okay. And that's why it's, it's you know, that's why the job and the task is so big because if we leave uh, teachers with a little direction, a lot will be missed in the process. Uh, and very respectfully, it's just a whole lot. And, and as, as much as, as we think our teachers are up to the task, the way instruction is going, it's just a whole lot to leave them on their own. That's why it's important to, one, not only have the resources, but be able to guide them uh, through the use of the resources. Yeah, that, that's the other part of my question. So the staff development, right, that's indicated on the third bullet of actually the third performance goal. That staff development is clearly tied to the use of this loft. And how often would that staff development be? Other than like the, the ongoing planning sessions, staff development meaning in-house formal staff development or coming from outside the district? It's, it's all in-house, and our instructional coaches um, have access to this. And so what they do is they basically create a needs list by teachers, and so they say, you know, how many teachers uh, need the support as they're talking and having these conversations. And then they'll very easily establish a cluster meeting in the afternoon to be able to do a one-to-one -one setting to be able to roll this out. And it happens as often as it needs to happen. You know, if they do this in, in the first six weeks and then very quickly the second six weeks they're struggling to get through the documents, they'll set up that session, whether it's one-to-one, -one, whether it's a small group, or a whole faculty meeting if they need to. <coughs> okay. Because as myself, as someone still struggling with Office 365, I'm curious about the <laughs> staff development availability and when it's offered. Now, it's also teacher friendly in that it, it is not going to overburden people in their schedules, right? I mean, we can work within people's schedules as well. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mr. Messa, you? I just you? wanted to comment that this is one of the best things that I've seen in instruction. And um, it certainly will do a, a world of good for those beginning teachers. And all the work that goes on throughout the year as far as lesson planning and you know, getting good ideas um, to be able to come up with the best instruction that goes on throughout this district. And um, I think this is a great start. I know it's work in progress, but I, it's just one of the best things that I've seen. And I hope that eventually we'll get to the point of um, assessment and individual uh, success where, uh, you know, all the, uh, the work that goes on, whether it's um, a pretest, or, or whether it's just some form of assessment, the teachers will have access immediately and um, check on how students are doing in, in case uh, you know a question comes up uh, from a 
prepare it and, and they can look it up because I know that eventually uh, it will lead to that since it's all tied in. Sure. Would that be correct? Yes, sir. Okay. The, the, it, really, the, the, the point that I want to make is that it is a, a fun task. It's what we love to do, but it is very daunting, and that's why it needs to continue to have a lot of focus. I can tweak the goals from year to year, but at the end of the day, at the end of the year, at the end of the five-year period, our goal is to develop a sound instructional system, and it can't change too much from one year to the next. We just have to upgrade it and improve upon it. Last year was a little bit difficult implementing the planning protocol because we really didn't have the uh, resources as accessible as they should have been. With this next step, we continue with the planning protocol, but we make it easier for the teachers so they can visualize it and have more options. Um, what percentage, uh, and I know it's a work in progress, would you say you have all of those resources already completed? Over six weeks and we're working. So for every grade, every no. subject? No. No. We, we have uh, elementary, I feel pretty confident because we've had consistency at the elementary level. Unfortunately, at the secondary level, if y'all will remember, our uh, secondary curriculum coordinator moved to Ohio, I believe, and the person that was hired to replace that person uh, stayed at the high school until the end of the year. And there's just something to be said for, for leadership and, and being on top of it because it has been uh, a lot of times seven days a week work and extra hours. So now that we have some consistency at the secondary level, uh, the task for the secondary curriculum coordinators and the coaches and the teachers that come in to do the, the curriculum review is to play some catch up. But I think that they're uh, off to a good start, but they really got about a three month lag. Uh, so they have some catching up to do. Uh, although there are some evidences of it at the secondary level, that's where we now begin to, to put our resources to catch up on it. But at the elementary level, I think it's safe to say it's all there for the first six weeks. And is this accessible to anybody or only teachers? Um, yeah, I don't want to say that it's only accessible to teachers, although that's the goal for our uh, community, but I really don't know if the, the outside people can access can you, it. Can you take us to the home page and just go back in? I mean, Absolutely. That way. Well, you need a password, so I would oh, say okay. yes. Right. It's, it's accessible yeah. only to um, district personnel. Just like we log into the computer, okay. you use your same login to log into SharePoint. So as long as you have an email okay. with a district, then you can log in. Okay. Is this information proprietary to our district, or are we taking this from somewhere else? A lot of what's on there, we've built ourselves. But we're also able to load other resources that we take, whether we take them from C-Scope or just lessons that are out there on the web or resources. Um, so it's nothing that we can sell to another district uh, because it's a lot of free resources that we pull together. Uh, our curriculum documents are entirely ours. Okay. And then last question. I noticed, Miss um, Solis, when you were it's one of the first places you went to, the year at a glance. Show you, can we show you where it's on the website? Yeah, so could you do that first? Um, if we go to our school district website and then we click on employee links, it'll take you to this page. And this is where all of our teachers know to access. And so as you scroll down, you'll see SharePoint listed down here at the bottom. Uh, you'll click there. Um, because I'm already logged in, it will probably take me straight to it. Now, if I were to log off, it would ask me for my credentials and then take me to the SharePoint page. So the year at a glance? Uh-huh. Do you want me to go back to that year at a glance? Absolutely. I just noticed C-Scope in that far left corner. Is uh -huh. that something that is copyrighted, or we're okay to continue calling it that and using it as such, or? No, that, that particular template there, mm -hmm. uh, in Y'all feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I, I created that template when C-Scope was there when I was still the, the assistant superintendent for instruction in another district. Mm -hmm. Now, they revamped it over the summer 
with the teacher input and how we aligned it, but I bet that that just stayed there as an oversight. Yes. Oh, I just wonder if we should make sure we sure, read absolutely. all the uh, yes, we will, absolutely. And um, really, it should say that TEKS resource system because we still do have a curriculum um, component that we utilize, but this is um, definitely local. We're able to take what the TEKS resource system provides for us, and then we're able to um, change those documents as needed, and that's where our teachers have the flexibility. They come in during the summer and make those decisions um, as a group. Other questions? How uh, on on this? Uh, what, what are we? What are you calling it? It's curriculum loft, or is it, am I getting confused? No, it's SharePoint. called SharePoint. All right, so shared files, right? That's what we know it is. Okay. All right, on the SharePoint, uh, how how much when when this was put together, I guess, or created, whatever the term is. How much of the end user was involved in how it would be put together and how it would be accessible? I mean, uh, Dr. Garson. <laughs> sure yes, he led the he led the charge on uh, okay. on putting it together. Um, like Dr. Rio said, um, Mr. Casillas and his group went to uh, Arizona and they brought this idea to us, and we sat down, brainstormed a little bit of what we wanted it to look like. And there was some. Uh, models out there, for example, the curriculum loft that the middle school was using. So we got together and we said, we don't want to make it too complicated and we want the tabs to show up of the, of the courses that we want or the grade levels that we want and then two steps to get to where we want. And that's exactly what happened. So there was, there was a committee of uh, the curriculum and instruction and uh, then we got together with the programmer and uh, the programmer helped us out with certain things on the back end making sure that we would understand the back end of how to load things, but not necessarily share that with the entire staff because it would be kind of complicated. Now, what we wanted was to make sure that it was an easy document to get to. Two steps and we're there on anything we want. So as you notice, you go to the actual website. This is what I was talking about right here. We wanted to make sure that we would label that that's exactly the, the actual sketch that we had. I think it's still there in CNI. And then we wanted two steps to get to wherever we were going to get. Right here, hover over it, and get there. And that's the communication we had with that committee. And then we shared it with them, and this is where we came from. How large came. was the committee? You mentioned. Uh, originally, it was, um, I would say, about seven people. Okay. And, and what what... Now, using this, right, starting this year, what method is in place by mid-year, I guess, or towards the end of the year, for feedback from the end users, from the teachers and the coaches that are using it on a daily basis as to what works and what doesn't and what's improvable and what's not? Well, one thing that we do see every single day is when the group of teachers sit down together and there's someone in front of it, they see some immediate feedback of the things that they see right there in front of them. I mean, that's immediate because it's not left alone. Uh, have we come up with a plan of what's going to happen at midterm with that question that you have, sir? No, we have not come up with that, but that's a good idea. We can come back and review whatever we have here and find out if the information that's in there is valid and how much more can we do to improve it. We have not come up with a plan of action in that respect, sir, but we can definitely uh, look into it. Also, what we do is our Fridays, our CNI Fridays, so when the coaches come in and if they experience some difficulties, then they brainstorm, they let my then know what concerns they're having so that they can try and correct it. And I can also tell you all that as we've been going through this process, uh, one of the biggest things is just, I mean, it's by trial and error. So like here, for example, um, you'll see curriculum resources. Well, you might think, well, isn't there a tab that says resources? Well, there is, but it's by six weeks. And so in this case, we've put together some curriculum resources that really overlap over the entire year. So we're really just kind of finding out where to place things and then making sure that that goes back to the teacher so that they know as they navigate to the page, how do we access it? Um, because a lot of times, again, you click here and then you go here and all of a sudden a box comes up. 
well, it's not expected that teachers would know to click on fourth grade um, to get information, but they can. So those are all the things that we've gone through um, as we've trained our teachers to navigate the site. But it's definitely a trial and error, and, and we're learning along the way, and it's been really neat to see that. So if, if I understood you correctly, Mr. Garabedian, uh, because this is part of what we're leading for, uh, for my goal, and it should be a measurable goal, you want me to be able to relate to the board in a measurable way how it's improved uh, what we're doing on a daily basis. Am I, am no, I not, no, not necessarily. What I was thinking is, me as a teacher in the classroom, right, I have this SharePoint, right, database, which is giving me uh, easily accessible curriculum materials. But my experience as a teacher, right, needs to, my feedback needs to go back to the people who are what did you call it, behind the scenes or in the back room, right? Because you're seeing the database in one way, and they're experiencing it possibly in a different way. I mean, so that, you know, this works great after three or four months. This was problematic. You know, that type of feedback is, I guess, what I'm asking. And actually, it, that has already happened with the people that are helping us because I know that uh, my day and uh, Mrs. Sutton, have done that. They have communicated, well, this is not working the way we want it to work, so it works back toward those people. But then we need to get all the people that are actually using it, like you're saying, and find out, okay, what difficulties you're having so that we can go back to the back end and correct it. We need to encourage a constant dialogue. Uh, like I said, they, they, they meet as a, uh, it really is bigger than that. Because we're still getting teachers used to the idea of that collaboration, you know, we first have to make sure that we religiously get them to use the documents that are on there to inform the depth of the instruction uh, and get feedback based on, on how it shapes their instruction and how accessible they are. So through constant dialogue is really the best way that we can do it. And that really does tie back to uh, district goal two, the first bullet <coughs> under goal you listed, yes, which is uh, to implement programs that address the improvement of teacher climate and overall district morale. Um, that we know that much of what we heard from teachers about the planning protocol last year was that they didn't have um, the sufficient support, sufficient resources. So what Mr. Garabedian was saying would be perfect to go back and say, okay, we want to hear back from you. We want that morale to be um, better than it was last year as it relates to the planning protocol. So that two-way communication is definitely necessary. And a, a, an item that I had brought up um, uh, several months ago, Dr. Rios was actually having a teacher committee to talk about these things. Now I know you're having that that dialogue with them at cluster meetings and at your instructional meetings, but maybe something that would be a little more formalized so that we make sure that we're addressing the teacher's concerns as it relates to the planning protocol. Sure. Because it's the same time I just something to think about. Other question, Mr. Overfeld? <clears throat> I'm looking at it here on, on my computer and um, we'll take first grade as an example uh, there. I went to first grade science, and why would lesson plans and resources and multimedia all be blank and not have any lesson plans in there? There's actually several that don't have lesson plans. Right. <clears throat> That's the part that we are definitely working on to make sure that we get that complete. So, for example, these first six weeks documents, um, our instructional coaches are finalizing those this Friday. They come together to finalize first six weeks plans. Um, we started during the summer, but we only had teachers come in to work on curriculum review, not necessarily focusing on developing the lesson plans. And so by this Friday, you'll see the second six weeks documents go up along with any lesson plans that are the exemplar lessons for that first six weeks. And again, we're working on making sure that that gets done in advance, um, but because it is something that was rolled out 
very close to the same time that we're trying to get it implemented, um, it is something that we're working very, very diligently on on getting them up. So you'll notice that the lesson plan resources and multimedia components are not filled to capacity. Right now we've got C scope and uh, scope and sequence assessments and any of your yearly documents complete for elementary for six weeks. And then you'll notice uh, we spot check some. You'll see some fourth grade social studies. You'll see some fifth grade math. You'll see some third grade uh, lessons. It just depends on how those items have come in. So, I'm sorry. But the lesson plans for the first six weeks won't be on the system until possibly the end of this week, which puts you at the fifth week because we're in the fourth week, the middle of the fourth week of the, the first six weeks, right? Yes, sir. But the lesson plans that we're putting on here, they're not the lesson plans that every campus is, is developing. Those are ongoing. But what we're doing with this system, our hope is to load the lesson plans that one are exemplar lessons that can be used as valid resources for teachers that have been reviewed um, and that we can feel good about putting up there always. So teachers are planning on a daily basis, but what we want to do is build the resources. So there has to be a quality assurance check on there. That's why this really has to be a building process throughout the whole year and not just put everything up there uh, for the sake of filling it up because this is something that we're creating ourselves. Other questions? Okay, I think that takes us. <clears throat> One question. Yes, sir. You know, I can see the sequential order and everything and what you're being covered, et cetera. What I would like to see is how do you implement, how do you find out whether the, the teachers, especially in math, whether they're teaching the format exactly the way it should be? Because I notice the questions, uh, uh, I'm an old teacher. I uh, taught chemistry, I taught math, and, I, and sometimes some of those questions that are being asked of the kids are oh, out of this world. So how do you... Find out whether the implementation from the first grade through at least the sixth grade, uh, do you, I sure would like to see an implementation lesson as to how do you proceed in, in making those presentations. So are you talking about the actual I'm talking the actual the, the monitoring, actual monitoring of, of the classrooms, if you're yes, really sir. presenting. Because, being you know, all the, <laughs> the, uh, um, Lessons that uh, what you're going to cover and everything, numbers, doesn't do mean anything to me, to be honest with you. Yeah. What I'd like to see is how the implementation of this curriculum. Well, there are several things that, that we're doing that we're also tweaking this year. Um, one of the things that we are requesting is to make sure there is a department leader in the, in the actual planning protocol. The other one is uh, making sure that the assistant principal or the principal is also within that planning protocol. And they are... Uh, not facilitating, but understanding what is actually being planned. And then their role is to make sure that when they actually do the walkthroughs, that, they, that whatever they heard in these planning protocols is also shared with the planning protocol team, but more importantly, with actually the teacher by coaching them in certain ways to get to a point where, where you want to be because that's what you said you were going to do in the planning protocol. Not as an attack mode, but as a coaching. We want to make sure that we're monitoring that way so that all of us can be together in the team. It's not attack, it's coaching to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Uh, for example, today we met, uh, Ms. Garcia and myself, we met with the uh, leadership at North Heights Elementary and the leadership at Calderon. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that very same question. Mm -hmm. One thing is to plan and the discussions that happen, but we have some teachers that are new uh, first year or, or some teachers that really just haven't had all the formative experiences that they need. So we talked about uh, the leadership team. For example, at North Heights, we added a curriculum coordinator because we identified it as a high need campus to spend their half a day, four days a week. So the expectation is that uh, Ms. Sanchez, who is, is the person assigned along with uh, the rest of the leadership select teachers where they actually go and co-teach if necessary to help the teacher implement the lesson and get experience at it um, or observe the teacher and, and then have that dialogue or model uh, uh, do a model lesson 
for the teachers so that we help them be able to implement the lesson successfully because all the planning uh, can fall apart if you're not able to deliver in the classroom. So I hope that answers your question, Mr. Chibi. Yeah. yeah, I can see it because it, it'd be frustrating if I couldn't understand exactly what the theories are right. and be and go out there and try to – and this is what interests me. So we have that model at, at uh, various of the campuses that need extra support, but the expectation is that everybody have those practices. And I guess uh, the answer to my question would be to visit and see what's, what it is. So uh, if you don't mind, one of the states I sure would like to, to go to a classroom. Absolutely, sir. We'll, we'll pick a campus and, and we'll go there. Appreciate the expectation is that the Saints will be happy in, in, at every one of our campuses. And, and uh, you know, this has definitely been a lot of work. I, I think that, you know, when – uh, Mr. Mesa first suggested it. I said, how in the world are we going to do this? But then they went to Arizona. And they came back with some ideas. We hired a consultant to help us do all this. But it's something that we're going to build for the long haul. It's something that we're going to own, and nobody can take it away. Uh, and we can always improve upon it. So I know that you all have done a lot of work, and, and uh, definitely appreciate it. Other, other questions under these three bullets? I have a question. I think y'all are done. I just want clarification on the second bullet in this first part here. So how many are we talking about? Various, right? Student support programs to include district-wide early literacy program, writing initiative, drug awareness and bullying, hazing prevention, student leadership programs. So are we enumerating four or five significant support programs? My, my goal or, or my intent here was uh, – to qualify and quantify various with the ones I've listed here because these are the ones that we're more fully launching this school year. The early literacy program, this is the year. And we're going to go through some growing pains on that one, but I really trust that uh, Ms. Galindo uh, will provide uh, the necessary guidance to, to develop that early literacy because we don't have one. Uh, the writing initiative, we started last year at the elementary level. But this year we expanded it with all the training that we did through the grant, but now we have to implement it. So we train the teachers, but now we have to make sure that it comes to fruition in the classrooms and that, that we then train the other secondary teachers who didn't get the Abydos training. The drug awareness, uh, bullying, hazing prevention, there again, last year we were only able to do one random uh, check by the time we fully implemented the pro program. So this year we want to do one. Uh, six weeks. Dr. McNamara today presented me with a timeline uh, for uh, completing these checks. So it's something that we started last year, but we did, really didn't see it all the way because it took a while to, to, to start. And then the student leadership program, that's uh, the leader in me that you all approved and, and we trained over the summer and we're now implementing it. So various is described exactly with what is written here. So, right. that's, that's what I was asking. It's enumerated, right? Count them. So it's those specific. Yes. Okay, I think we're probably good on that first batch where Ms. Lozano has a question. I, I, I just don't want to lose sight of safe environment and how you will ensure that we have a safe environment. I know that uh, the district hired Mr. Sheedy last year. Um, I, I just want to make sure we're, we remain focused on a, a, providing a safe environment. Yes, ma'am. And um, you know, what Mr. Sheedy does is uh, unfortunately responding to a crisis situation. That's a lot of the work and, and training on how we respond. But uh, this year, uh, Mr. Salinas will make sure that we have the single point of entry places at the elementary schools that uh, the Citizens Committee approved through the $25 million construction project. Um, so this year, hopefully, we'll see the implementation of that along with the uh, different trains that Mr. Sheedy will provide. So ab absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I concur with Ms. Lozano. It's not specifically stated, mm -hmm. but uh, there, I think there was several phases, right, expected. First, he came on board and spent an awful lot of time developing very good campus plans, right, and, and outlined those steps. And then my understanding was that also led to a much more uh, deliberate practice, right, of those events. and. Probably the last report that we had of some type was someone help me out, what, March, March April, April, something like April. that? Yes, and, so, and next month we'll bring the district wide okay. presentation. Okay. 
Okay, so let's look at the, the bullets under District Goal 2. My question would be that first bullet. Uh, this is clearly uh, an example of good use of the survey, the TASB survey, because we certainly found that there were areas in terms of uh, the climate and, and morale that need to improve. So specifically, you're addressing, so the superintendent will explore and implement programs that address the improvement of teacher climate and overall <coughs> district morale. So specifically, give me some ideas. I know you've mentioned a few things when we've talked one-on-one, -on -one, but I mean, what do you see in the next two months, three months, four months, you doing perhaps, or others doing that are going to, to address that? There's, there's uh, numerous, numerous things that, that we'll be doing. Um, one of the first things that I'm doing as a superintendent is scheduling informal visits with small groups of teachers at different campuses to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation so that they know that their voices are heard in terms of what they need. Uh, having uh, myself present at faculty meetings is good in the sense that it allows me to roll out the agenda for the improvement, but it's not necessarily the most appropriate venue to get the feedback. So having that type of one-on-one of, uh, -on -one conversation is something that was suggested by some teachers. Uh, and that I've asked uh, the chief instructional officers to set up with each campus and to have those continuous conversations in the morning and then the follow-up. Uh, the other uh, piece that we are going to do is, uh, I know that Ms. Lozano suggested having the teacher forum. Uh, so we're in the process of organizing that. Uh, Dr. Garza will be organizing that for me. Uh, the, obviously, providing the teachers with as many resources as possible uh, is going to be huge in, in this area. We have talked about other uh, areas uh, considering uh, with budget implications. You know, we'd like to, something I experienced in another district, and it might sound cheesy to some, but I think it goes a long way, is when you actually provide meals for campuses. And just so they know that you don't have to wait till the teacher of the year celebration to get a meal. Uh, but there are budget implications or donations that have to that, that go a long way with that. Uh, but by far the biggest one is providing them the resources and getting the feedback. Uh, for example, you know that this year we did not buy the uh, all the textbooks that we needed to because we want to get feedback from the teachers and really here. So we're not spending any less money. We're pro we're spending all the money that we have at our disposal, but getting their feedback on what they need and allowing them to select. The big part is the tweaking based on the feedback that we got from the client protocol uh, survey that we did uh, and the changes that we made through that and just following through to make sure that those have, uh, that those occur in a way that the teachers find them comfortable. Other questions on, on those were on the bullets under two. Mr. Mesa, it looks like you have a question or a comment. Yeah. Um, there's so many things that can be done, little things that mean a lot. For example, I, I know that um, when we had the mentoring program, you know, the, the birthdays were listed at least, you know, by campus and, and recognized those individuals. Um, a lot of times, you know, I know in, in our updates that we get, you might have visited a classroom and mentioned a certain teacher that was doing an outstanding job. It means so much when the administrator writes a little note saying, you know, the superintendent noticed what a great job you're doing. I mean, teachers will keep those notes forever up to the day they retire because they, they were praised. Uh, but there's other many things. I recognize teachers, for example, that have perfect attendance the whole semester, first semester. And then there's some that have perfect attendance the whole year and yet nobody hears about it except maybe their department, um, sometimes not even the whole campus. And, and so those are things that um, mean a whole lot, especially when it comes from administration, whether it's the campus principal, whether it's the department head, assistant principal, it doesn't matter. It's just that they're being recognized for doing above and beyond. Yes. I, I think that would improve a whole lot. Certainly celebrating success. Exactly. Right? And I, I could be wrong. 
I know this from conversations with people who were here for many years or have been here for many years. But I was told once that the teacher appreciation that's done at the end of the year began close to 20 years ago, 15, 16 years ago, and it was when the district made recognized status, and then it was done subsequently every year. So, like Mr. Mesa says, you know, what sense then on a campus level or a department level, kind of those little, yeah, you know, saying thank you, That's right, or recognizing people? Because I know we, uh, we were determined this year to give everyone a step, and teachers, you know, get a, a, a step on a new scale, and pay is important to morale, but other things are as well, right? Sometimes it's simple. Like, so, yeah, that, that makes sense. So I guess you'll kind of, as those things happen, you can let us know what. Absolutely. Anything else under, on that batch, the ones in the middle? I am going to point out the obvious. Uh, there is a editing problem on here. Uh, under District Goal 3, the first bullet is also uh, listed as bullet 2. Under, so that needs to be striked. Yes. Can, but can that's I, just a typo. I did have something on, mm -hmm. on District Goal 2. Um, the third, fourth bullet, actually. By January 2015, the superintendent will form a committee to respond uh, to the district's needs, as indicated by the by commission demographic study, I, I just want to be, be clear at this point that you, you know, as you read that, you, you hear prepare and present a facility improvement plan with projected costs and recommendations for attainment of necessary funds. I, I, I keep bringing up Buena Vista because you know we ask for waivers. I mean, as long as I've been on this board, we ask for waivers and waivers, and I'm thinking, we need to get a school going up on the north side here. And, and I just want to say, redrawing the boundary is not going to be a solution for me. <laughs> you know, we need to think about a facility with all the new housing that is going up in that direction. Now, we'll wait for the demographic study to be done, but I, I just want to say that, to me, a solution of redrawing the district boundaries is not going to be a solution. Mr. President, I agree with you 100%. <coughs> However, having said that I agree with you, I also know that if this body chooses to build the school north of, of, of uh, the Y or, or anywhere in that area, it takes a bad, at, at the even as fast-paced as we might push somebody, it, it takes 18 months to, to build a school, minimum. Uh, and I really think, and I wholeheartedly agree with you that Buena Vista needs some relief now. So uh, in advance, just knowing the numbers that Buena Vista grew this year, Ms. Valdez presented to me today numbers that indicate that we grew as a district by another 100-plus uh, students which on the one hand, it's nice to know that we might have $1.6 million extra this year because of our increased attendance. Uh, I know that waiting a year and a half is not an option because the school needs some relief now. And I really wish uh, uh, that we would have been able to foretell the growth that, that happened there this year that we weren't expecting. Uh, but it needs some relief now. So unfortunately, we probably will be faced with having to present to y'all at least a temporary fix of redrawing the boundaries because they need some relief now. Now, coupled with that recommendation, Mr. Mesa, will be the, the addition of more facilities, whether they be to the south and, and, and push the population that way or whether they be to the north and spread it out. That will really be for this board to decide. Uh, I won't feel uh, married to any option. I'll, I'll be married to the option of increasing the size of our facilities, but that will be for this board to, to direct me on which way they, they, they want me to go with that. But we have to redraw the lines, at least for this coming year, to provide some relief. There's no other way about it, temporarily. Okay, so that takes us to the last couple of bullets under the district's <coughs> goal three. <coughs> Any questions on either of those? And you'll notice that first bullet, like I said, that was a, just a typo that 
was overlooked, so that needs to get scratched out. It either stays there or it goes under the other. I guess that's irrelevant, but it gets scratched out. I have a, I have a note on that, for sure. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I shared this with you all on, on, on Friday and over the weekend. Uh, I looked over them again, and the one part that I omitted in the we can just add now, and, and if you all approve these tonight, it'll be as such, is um, the superintendent will maintain protocols for communicating with uh, district personnel. And then the next one, um, I wanted to include one in there about the, um, the establishment of the curriculum and operations committees to provide uh, as comprehensive a packet of information as possible. So that's the one, one I would have would have added since we've talked about establishing the committees. And you also established the student council, whatever yeah. that's called. Yeah, Superintendent's Advisory Council. Thank you. Questions on either of these two? <clears throat> Going back to uh, the third <laughs> bullet under District Goal <clears throat> 2. Superintendent will ensure that the developed and approved 2014-15 balanced budget is implemented in a manner that is transparent and conducive to providing for the immediate long-term needs of our students. Uh, in terms of a goal, and I don't, I don't want anyone to get the wrong impression, but that was well established last year. I mean, do we still want it on there this year? I mean, the idea of a goal is you set that goal, you accomplish the goal, then you take it off the table and you move on to something else. I mean, if, certainly we can leave it. I'm just wondering. Well, I think I think Yana Kani can improve every year. You know, okay. All right. do it. Well, then we'll keep her under pressure. Right? Well, she's done an outstanding job, but I think you know we. So we want it to be more <laughs> transparent than it's already transparent, or, or well, better. <laughs> really, the budget is the hardest thing for us to understand. Well, I'm, I'm saying for myself, you know, it's one of the most difficult things to understand. But she's made it so easy that you know it, it's transparent and she's reached that goal but i think she can go beyond it <laughs> well, and really when we're talking about uh, i'm focusing on the provider for the immediate and long-term needs of our students and as long as we have a rating of a five on the fast report i just don't see how, how we're there yet okay and <clears throat> just one more thing and then i won't hold anything up any longer run that first bullet under two, does that include, uh, we, we keep talking about customer service and what people feel is, you know, maybe not real effective customer service. I mean, does that include that as well? Is that something that's still going to be looked into? No, I, absolutely. And, and I'm glad you brought it up because it gives me a chance uh, to uh, thank the bank and trust. Uh, at the beginning of the year, they brought their team they had been working with um, Yanakani Valdez, who was spearheading that uh, training. Uh, they planned it throughout last year. At the beginning of the year, they brought a team here, and we started training all the people that touched the public. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was very successful, and we're, we're definitely going to continue to monitor it. Okay. Plus, some of the health education initiatives that <clears throat> I know that Ms. Valdez is working on goes a long way for teacher climate also. Okay. okay, anything else? So just for clarification, since we're all looking at the same page, under District Goal 3, that first bullet is a typo, so that's erased because it's under this other section. Any questions? Okay, well, there's really... Uh, a couple of possibilities. As, as you know, next month, according to our calendar, we come back and we make sure that the instrument <coughs> is completely put together and that it's what we want it to be. So at this time, we're talking about the goals. This is the superintendent saying, based on you know the results of the last cycle, based on board priorities, assessment, etc., these are six or seven or eight major implementations that, that he wants to get the green light to move forward on. So is everybody okay with that? So we can 
get this out of the way, and then we'll come back in a month to finalize the instrument itself. Yes, with the few edits or whatever that we did. Okay. All right then. Is there a motion to accept the 2014-15 superintendent's performance goals as presented? Ms. Lozano has motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Okay, it's unanimous. Motion carries. Sure, go ahead. You all talk about praise and uh, celebrating with teachers. And, uh, at least as it relates to the first goal, I know that there is a lot of work that has been done by teachers that came in the summer, uh, the leadership in the curriculum department and organizing all this because it's something that we do locally has just been uh, impressive. They put in a lot of hours. Uh, we certainly don't compensate them for it. We did pay the teachers some money for coming in the summer, but I think that we're on to something great. We just have to be consistent and you guys, uh, have done just a phenomenal job, and I look forward to seeing the end product at the end of the year. So thank you so much. And, and this, by the way, this is pub basically public information. There's nothing confidential about it. I know we didn't put it on the screen or anything. Uh, so when you finish editing it, I guess you put it up there in that location on the website, and then when we put the whole instrument together, that can come down, and that will be on it. Because so, somebody actually did ask me once, well, why is XYZ going on, this was a while back, and I said, well, it's one of the performance goals, and that's why you see that committee meeting and whatever and this and that, so that, that would be helpful to be able to do that when you edit it. Okay, agenda item 10B. Oh, we slowed down, didn't we? It's now 720, so, so much for my 6, oh, it's 620, we're halfway through. Okay, agenda item 10B. Discussion of the district's communication outlets, website, Facebook, Channel 39. This was something I wanted to talk about. I know it's part of the goals. So I want to get some, some clarification. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to pick on any part of the web page or anything like that. But look, this is, this is what I see, and you all need to jump up and down and tell me if I'm wrong. A couple of years ago, there was uh, angst, so to speak, right, that the website was cluttered, the website was not updated regularly, and... There was a goal to revamp the website, and it was revamped. And I think it's it's a better website. I am kind of uh, troubled, however, when sometimes it looks like things are out of date or things are becoming redundant. So what is the process? That, I guess, is my first question. Is there an actual process, like, for example, where perhaps each department or each campus by the first Friday of every month or something like that submits additions to their page and then when that happens stuff that's no longer relevant gets taken off because maybe I'm imagining it but people seem to think that it might be getting cluttered again and it's a nice site it took a long time to get to this point so what is the process well there's a couple things uh, first there was a whole lot of work that was done this last year in formatting the web page so it would be common from one department to the other and that really did take a whole lot of time. Unfortunately, uh, our webmaster took another job uh, okay. somewhere. We have now uh, posted and recruited an, another webmaster who's unable to come on board yet. So hopefully that person will come on board uh, soon enough and, and they can continue the work that the gentleman before have done. But one thing that should be happening is that uh, Mr. Casillas suggested last year that we hire, uh, not webmasters, but people to do the work at each campus so they would continue to update it, and we budgeted some money for, for that uh, piece. Now, here in the last couple of weeks, what we've asked is we've asked uh, Mr. Luna to set some time during the week that's specifically dedicated to reviewing the web page for uh, updates to make sure nothing is outdated while the gentleman comes in that we hired that would review it. But but Nick uh, left us about a month and a half ago, Mr. Garcia, uh, and it has been a big void. Uh, but in the interim, we, we do have, uh, we have set up a process with, with Reno Luna uh, to continuously re review the web page. But, but we need to get the new webmaster on board. So, um, like on that performance goal about enhancing, right, the, 
digital media. That's part of that process. I guess will be part of it to have, have a more systematic way of making sure that the website stays clean, you know, for lack of a better word. That's part of it, yes, but it's, uh, it's a lot bigger than that, but yes, it's, it's definitely part of it. The other, the, the other issue with the digital media is uh, our Channel 39. Right. So I'm going to get to that one. Yeah. Okay, so Facebook. So we started Facebook yes, uh, a while back. I don't have a Facebook. I never will have a Facebook. I'm Facebookless, so. All right, so how, how does the web page and the Facebook, how do they complement each other? Because somebody tells me, oh, XYZ is on uh, the, the, the site, and I'm like, no, it's not. I was just there. Oh, no, it's on the side, the other side, and they're talking about the Facebook. So how does it complement each other? I guess what I'm trying to find out is if we want to communicate better as a district, right, more is certainly not necessarily better. I know we have a Facebook page now and a, you know, the enhanced hopefully continue to be enhanced district websites. So how do they work together? Are they just two separate things? or they're, they're two separate items, completely separate items, but most of the stories, the headlines, and slideshows that you find on the website can also be found on Facebook. And I'm sorry about that. Uh, good evening, Honorable Board. Honorable board. Uh, Mr. President, Dr. Rios, my name is Rene Reno Luna, and I'm the Public Information Officer. And uh, Mr. Garabedian, uh, to answer your question, the information that you find on the website, as far as headlines and the slideshow, you will find on Facebook. The difference between Facebook and the website is you'll find just a little bit more detailed information on Facebook. Items such as a calendar, the, the calendar that you have here for the month of September 2014, it's not on the district Web website okay. homepage, but it is on the department page or the campus page. We share it on Facebook because a lot of parents like that instant access that they have on their phone, on their iPad, and a lot of times, like, you'll see that they add names to the, I don't know if you can see the mouse moving, they'll add or they'll tag their name so that the calendar will appear automatically on the, the person that they know's student at the, at the campus. So if they know my son is at, uh, in this case here, uh, Dr. Fermin Calderon, I'll be tagged, and when I open my Facebook, that information will be there. But a lot of times it's duplicate stories. The story that we received this morning in regards to the football game being free on Friday was posted immediately to Facebook and followed up on the, on the district website, the okay. district homepage. But a lot of times information, such as a calendar, wouldn't necessarily fall as a headline because really we wouldn't want that graphic there to be the, the opening page on, on the website. So we embed that link or that graphic to the department page, the campus page. Okay, Ms. Close, I, know you had oh, I, I just noticed, uh, Mr. Luna, somebody asked if the free of charge game is going to be this Friday. That That's one of the differences between Facebook and the school web site. Yes, this allows someone from the district to respond to uh, someone who might make a comment or it's very interactive, and uh, I have a district assigned phone, and the messages come to me, and if I can't get the message answered, I, I find the, the point of contact. Just right before the meeting, I contacted Mr. Cabello, who's sitting in the, right in the back. One of the messages was uh, in regards to... In regards to picture day at uh, freshman school. Got a message on my phone, tomorrow's picture day for freshmen, and they didn't need to be prepaid, but no amount or price was given. So I spoke to Mr. Cabello and <coughs> replied to the, the question. But Facebook is very interactive, and uh, once we receive the messages, we get a response and uh, reply to the, to the person asking the question. Oh. The great news yes. Thank you so much. Aside from that, we also have a, a YouTube channel where all the, the meetings can be viewed on demand. Any uh, videos that are created by the campuses are also placed on there. Not necessarily everything that is produced at the campuses, but uh, you know what is sent to us, we, we place on the YouTube channel for the district. Okay, my other question. And, all right, so channel 39, right? If, if I go out and I've heard this, that's why I'm bringing it up. I mean, people say, hey, what's up with the channel? So I, if I go out into the hallway and I watch us on TV, picture seems clear, the volume seems clear, right? Well, just 
uh, there seems to be variance, that's I guess what I'm trying to say, between what people are seeing sometimes in their living room, what's being, there's a technical problem, I think. Mr. Garabedian, the line that is uh, in the, the foyer is a direct line from the computer, so it's an absolute clear picture. Okay. The uh, issue that you're talking about, the uh, issue with the interference on the, the television, that's a Time Warner, and uh, I guess between our hub and their connection, there, there's a piece of equipment that needs to be replaced. From what I understand, uh, Time Warner has contacted our IT department, and the part has been identified. It's just a, a purchase that needs to be made. Okay, but, so but what you see here is just a direct connection okay. that doesn't go through any compression. That way, you, That's why you see the clear picture. Okay. Also, uh, if you notice, our graduation video looked spectacular, but that was recorded on a standalone camera at the field. And uh, I mean, it looked really, really good compared to our, mm -hmm. our captures that we do here. So the Time Warner thing, or the, I shouldn't say the, the Time interface. Warner thing, the Channel 39 issues, that's really a conversation between us and Time Warner, right? Of, Correct, of, yes, sir. That's kind of outside of our ability to fix Those by ourselves. Those talks have been going on throughout the, the summer. Details, okay. okay. Mr. Gervidian, I have been in communication with Time Warner since last year to mm -hmm. try and remedy the situation. And because it's a public channel and they are no longer committed by the, I guess, uh, statute to provide it, um, they actually have customers waiting to take that channel. So they pretty much have left it up to us to research, to contact engineers, to contact different video companies. And so we've gone through a roundabout way to finally figure out what equipment. So we have the equipment that we know that we need to replace in the, um, in the communications uh, center, but then it has to communicate with their center. So that conversation took place about two weeks ago. Uh, to where our feed will um, be synchronized with their feed okay. because it's all fiber. So it's been a long, exhausting process. Uh, they don't really commit uh, engineers or, or consultants because it's a public service channel and it's, a, it's yours, use it as you can. The equipment that's there is probably about 12 years old and so that's what I've been trying to, to, to remedy. So I'm almost there. They gave me two choices of two different pieces of equipment. So they said, pick one. If it's not the right one, then you have to buy the other one. So I'm trying to avoid that extra expense. Okay. But yes, and it's, it's on us. Ms. Lozano? Well, I've been watching uh, Mr. Luna on TV. That's also a public channel for the city council meetings, and those are much clearer. Right. Uh, the city and Time Warner have a different relationship than the school district. And <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rios would be nicer to, <laughs> to Time Warner. No, it's nothing like that. It's just, you know, the, the franchise and the all that. The franchise fees, there's a, a big difference. On the cable bill, there's a, a franchise fee that is in turn uh, transferred over to the, the city department for uh, reinvesting in their equipment. That's how they were able to modernize all their systems. Well, okay. Then help me out on this one. Uh, so we have videos of board meetings on YouTube. Correct. All right. They're also played periodically on channel 39, correct? All right. On September the 3rd, 2014, which was a special meeting uh, regarding the schematic designs of the CTE building and the old Del Rio 8th grade, that meeting was like two and a half hours or more. And it played as we met, correct? Because I talked to a couple people who yes. said that they saw the entire meeting. One person kind of took me to task, said that I was cheap when I said, well, I didn't feel like $2 million for administrative offices was something I wanted to go with. I also talked about the vote that night. I heard later that half of that meeting is missing. Correct. What happened to the other half of that meeting? Because now when you go to the video, it goes about an hour and a half in, and Correct. then we have technical difficulties. Correct, uh, Mr. Garabedian. During that meeting, the live broadcast, the live feed went off without a hitch. During the meeting itself, our computer froze, and the capture just stopped. If we would have stopped the computer and reset the computer, we would have lost the live feed. So it was a matter of, do we stop the live feed? Do we go with the, the recording? So we went with the live feed as not to disrupt the live feed. We did lose a good part of the meeting, 
when the board went into executive session, everything was stopped, rebooted, and the capture began again. But we did uh, note on the meeting that there were technical difficulties. Yes, yeah, I saw that. And I guess my other question is, how many meetings have we had that have had technical difficulties? I mean, to my knowledge, yes. that one. Yes. During my time, too, uh, the first meeting that I was at, um, we stopped the recorder, and the video capture itself didn't stop. So we had to get it redone. But uh, that's the second one during my tenure. Mr. Mesa? I, I would hope that each board member watches a board meeting because half of it you can't hear. This is why I get the, you know, the mic as close as I can. You can't hear the people. You can see them, but you can't hear. And so you're missing the whole content. It, it, you have to watch a whole meeting and you'll see what I'm talking about because sometimes it's us up here mm -hmm. and sometimes it's the people down there that are, that are presenting that we can't hear. So we miss a lot of the important information. That's all. Well, that's a good point. A lot of times we have uh, presenters or, or people that are not speaking to the mic or near a mic, and uh, that, that does affect the recording. We can't raise the microphone sensitivity a lot higher. If not, we'll get that feedback. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do have limitations on the microphone sensitivity. We'll, we'll invest as much money as, as we are able to to improve it. Uh, I, I think that I don't know how, how how much was the material, <laughs> Mr. Casillas. How much was the equipment that Time Warner needs us to buy? Uh, it's in the range of about seven thousand five hundred to ten thousand. Oh, that's, that's okay. It's doable. It's a piece of cake. All right. So as far as technical difficulties, there's only been a couple meetings that that's happened to. Because I started thinking, am I going to go back and check all the meetings and see how many times there's been technical? Two. I mean, you realize how that conversation went. I had somebody taking me to task for the things I said, and then the next day he said, well, it's all off the video. And I'm like, <coughs> I, you hit it. Yeah, so I didn't do it. Beyond our control, and as okay. soon as that happened, uh, I, identified, you know, I, I contacted our people, and you know, everybody was well aware that the recording was not being okay. uh, captured at that Yeah, time. that's what I, I didn't understand, because I know live they had seen it, and that's what they were talking live, about the it, next day. It went day. all the way through until we had time to, to set everything down and bring everything back. And Ms. Falcone knew where I was going because when she gave me the CD, I was like, and she told me, I was like, hmm. Okay. All right. Any other questions on that? More than anything else, I want to see where we're going in some of those improvements, right? What's being done or is on the agenda of being done. Thank you. Okay. Oh, somebody has something. Uh, in relation to social media, uh, there we use Facebook. We had a Twitter account and it went dormant a couple years ago there and I wonder why we don't have our Twitter account anymore as a way to instantly send out information. Other school districts do it. I was just curious as to why we don't use our Twitter feed anymore. Mr. Overfield, we're, we're working on an app for the school district that will work even better than Twitter to, to, uh, for people to put it on their phones How come Twitter went dormant like two years ago? Is it because we're worried about we can't control the Twitter responses? Well, I think uh, that was more my call because uh, Twitter is like a baby that you keep feeding it and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was just uh, getting to the point where, you know, you're spending all day, a lot, large part of your day Twittering. the SFDR highlights that we also work on. And, uh, you know, aside from social media, we're going back to the traditional media, the actual print, and that's due out in, uh, on the last Sunday of October. So there, we work multiple platforms other than just electronic. Okay. Ms. Lozano? I just wanted to say thank you to Mr. Luna again for the 
last several years that I've sat on the board, the communication is phenomenal. Thank you for making such great positive changes. <coughs> also, thanks to Mr. Casillas. Ms. Haynes? The same. I just wanted to say thank you for the Facebook because I am almost a Facebook junkie. <laughs> and uh, it really, the updates are really awesome. The pictures are also good to see. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This Friday night uh, during the football game, we're able to use Facebook, you know, effectively, mm -hmm. you know, to announce uh, the issues with, with the football game. And we caught the storm right over around the 50 yard line. And it was great. Thank you. It would be nice to catch it seven miles out. <laughs> <laughs> you caught it literally. Just one, one more quick thing getting back to the, the website itself. Uh, a lot of districts put not only their agendas but also their minutes on the website. And I, I understand you know, what you're saying about the webmaster and all that, but um, surely we can we can put the minutes on the website without a lot of difficulty, without a lot of work. Right? Print is easy to put up on the website. Yeah. I think we had mentioned that a while back, and maybe it was one of those things that just you know, didn't happen, or maybe it's a long time ago. But that would be nice moving forward when you have a webmaster and you go into that goal about enhancements and all that in minutes. I know you've, I'm almost positive Uvalde does it, Comstock does it, City does it, even though they're, they're a little bit behind, which is understandable, right? But at least the minutes are there as opposed to here. Someone has to come into the building, ask to see the book, and you know, sit down and see the book, and that's kind of archaic. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, agenda item 10C, discussion of the results and use of the House Bill 5 community and student engagement rating. So this was something else I wanted to, to clarify. So we had a committee. There was a committee brought together in the summer that met a couple of times that was a community committee uh, pointing out and assessing the level of community and student engagement, right, district-wide and campus-wide. Uh, I know in the board report that was provided. So my first question is, the results of that, right, the results of that assessment, the rating, not so much the rating itself, how is it used? How will it be used? I mean, I know it's a compliance document, but how is it used at individual campuses or as a district as a whole? I'll do our at that. Okay. Well, definitely we're going to review exactly what, uh, what was uh, the result that came out. We will uh, dissect it, make sure that uh, we understand exactly what communication the staff or whatever uh, information we got from it and bring it back to the principals, to the assistant principal, and to the actual uh, uh, campus uh, planning decision committee to figure out if there's things that we need to work on because of this um, uh, information, we need to make sure that we pay attention to it. It's going to be a little bit different coming this year with the committee of how we're going to do it because of some information that we've gotten from the board of how many people are going to be involved in so, this. So that committee is going to continue or a variation of the committee? Will it's continue. going to be a variation of the committee that we had last year, sir, right. because of the input that we've had from the board to make sure that we get the right people on the committee. But your original question is how are we going to use this? Now, how do you use and the... I, I, I can... I can Use an example. There is a campus out there that, or two campuses, that uh, one of the areas was uh, unsatisfactory, or I can't remember what the title is. Well, unacceptable. Just needs oh, yeah. Unacceptable. Needs and definitely, we're going to work on that because we know that's something simple that we can work on. Okay, it's a survey that was not collected, or it was not enough surveys were collected. So that's something simple. It's immediate. It's something that uh, we can we can fix immediately. And then. Um, Several of the things that were there that are not to the level where we want it to be, well, definitely, we need to look at it. What happened? What is it that the, the staff is telling us? What is it that the community is telling us that we didn't do properly? You cannot ignore it and get the committee together. There is a difference between the committee that actually grades us mm -hmm. and the committee that's actually going to follow through on what that committee say, which is the campus committee review it and they understand how to change this. Were there comments in that process, like written comments other than numerical, than just numerical scores? I in process in do the not believe there were comments. Uh, I know that when we were, when we met, 
the committee was making comments to the people that were there and the staff that was there uh, was uh, having dialogue with uh, the, or not having dialogue, but actually to <coughs> those committee members, making sure that they understood how they were grading it. But uh, there was one person that was very involved with it, which is Mrs. Smith. Do we have any written documents, uh, Mrs. Smith? Who, who, there, there were several, a number of district administrators, right, that were in right. those all meetings, the, like you All the were, campus principals. And Mr. Hernandez, you were too, right? Yes. And, and, and all the campus principals, all the directors, myself, Mrs. Garcia, we were all there. Okay. So there weren't written comments. No, we did do a survey at the end of everyone that was in the committee uh, asking what they thought of the process, how we could improve it, how we could improve it, um, what we could change about it. So there were written comments, yes. Okay. Mm. Of how to improve it, how to improve the committee. How to improve the process. Right. But not how to improve the, 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 the involvement, the, community involvement engagement. The measurement of the instrument. Since some of the comments were they need we needed to start earlier, we needed to have more meetings, we needed to have smaller meetings, break up into smaller groups where we had those nine components so that we could have each of them meeting separately and then come together mm -hmm. versus coming to all together as that large group and trying to develop something from there. And, and uh, just as a point of reference, this was a trial and error also because the state gave us some guidelines, but really they left it up to us. And we went out there, we looked at some models, and that's, that's what we brought to, to, uh, to this district to grade ourselves. It's a, it's a work in progress. We're going to do it a lot better this coming year <coughs> than what we had last year because of some of the input that we had from the committee and some of the input that we've had from the board. But I don't think that was the original question. I hope I answered your original question, Mr. Garabedian. Well, we'll revisit it. Do we have a planned meeting? Uh, it was one of the comments that Ms. Smith said is didn't meet right. soon enough. Yes, we do have something. I know that uh, Ms. Uh, Gomez, Ms. Gomez, Gomez, I know that she is in charge of it now. She is the federal program director. She will take the lead now with, uh, with this program. Good evening, Mr. Garavidi and Dr. Rios, members of the board. Um, Dr. Garza is right. At this time, we have compiled all of the information and shared it with the campuses. There were comments that were made on the surveys. Those might be the comments that you are referring to. Okay, so there were comments about the actual... Parental component. Okay. Yes, and that, that was divided into different sections, and there were comments made. All of those have been compiled and shared with the campuses. And from there, we are planning on making... All the campuses are planning on making um, adjustments to what the community is saying. Um, that was just on the one component. That's the only one that had a survey. All the rest were rated based on what the campuses did, and it does all fall under House Bill 5. Um, how many events are we having? How, many, how are we communicating with parents and, and that type of information? Just to make it clear that that is one component of the nine factors that are there. Right, just the one. The other ones are just based so slowly, um, solely on how, how many events did we have, how many meetings did we have, how, how do we do we communicate in both languages, and it was basically um, information that was tallied. Now, one of the things is we didn't get the information, I know because I was a principal at that time, until late in spring. It's difficult to remember in April you know, what meeting you had in September and October. And therefore, I feel like the campuses didn't really have the opportunities to keep an accurate record of everything that they did. Because I do know that it, it was, um, they worked a lot harder than maybe what the survey results showed. So that's what Dr. Garza was saying, we will start earlier this year. And the reason that we came out in the spring is because HB5 was not finalized until That, that was my main question, that comments that had been made, right, input about how to improve as well as the scores that that was being used or would be part of a 
process of use move, moving forward. So indulge me then, at what point, a month from now, two months from now, we might get a brief uh, update on how those are being used? We will definitely bring up something to you next month, the next board meeting, and tell you where we're at, how we're using this data from the old instrument, and we will also update you on some data of what we're doing this year. Thank you. Like I said, we'll revisit it because I know parental and community involvement is important. Okay. All right. It, uh, it's now 7.45 p.m. and we are on agenda item 11, curriculum instruction. A, consideration and approve the submission of the 2014-15 request for maximum class size waiver exception to Texas Education Agency. Ms. Ide Garcia is presenting. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, members of the board. Each year, uh, every school district must conduct a survey uh, for classroom enrollment for kindred through fourth grade. If the survey indicates that any class for grades K through four exceed the allowable class size limit of 22 to one, the district must request a maximum class size waiver exception. Uh, our district conducted the class enrollment survey on Friday, September the 12th, and the district survey indicates the following. We have uh, 32 classrooms that exceed the, the maximum 22 to 1 ratio. At Buena Vista, we have 17. At Dr. Fermin Calderon, total of 6. Garfield, 7 and Lamar, two, for a total of 32. Questions? Is there we probably all have questions. Mr. Mesa indicated, let him go first. And then Ms. <laughs> I've been on the board eight years. I've never seen 32. This is the biggest we've ever had. And it kind of makes me think, you know, that the facilities money that we had could have been used, you know, <laughs> to improve the situation at Buena Vista. But, you know, that's water, you know, past the bridge or whatever. You know, like we need to do something to alleviate the overcrowded classrooms. And, um, you know, every parent of these students, the biggest investment that they make is their home. When they buy a house in whatever area they want to buy it, they want their children to go to that school. And this is why I, I, I keep you know, reiterating again, I, I want to wait for the demographic study, but from all indications, you know, it's pointing in that direction. And there's houses going up, you know, it's like weekly whether it's uh, Lake Ridge Estate or whether it's Buena Vista area. And I mean, I, I, we need some immediate relief. And, and again, I am not going to vote for a district, you know, redrawing of the boundaries. Something needs to get done and it needs to be done like starting yesterday. Mr. Overfeld, do you I just had a, a question on the <clears throat> the spreadsheet there at Dr. Fermin Calderon. Um, two fourth grade classes, Miss Wynn and then Miss Wynn. Are, are there two? Oh, I'm sorry. Miss Wynn's there? That's no. At that campus that now? Probably just one? That'd be that one, yes. There's just one, but there is two fourth grade classrooms, right, Brenda? That we have over three. We three are over. So it's Miss Flores, Miss Wynn, and Sorry, sorry, I was trying to drop to 31 for you. No. <laughs> no, I sent this to the principal to verify. But. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Anyway. <laughs> well, you know, I certainly concur with Mr. Mess, all right, that this is indicative of a larger challenge. But let's not forget, you know, the, the instructional issue. We can point to lots of research that says class size matters in terms of 
student achievement. And I think I'm probably almost reading Ms. Lozano's mind. What was it last year? I mean, we know this is worse this year. What was it last year? Okay, last year we had a total of 20. Uh -huh. We had Buena Vista with 11, Lonnie Green, 2, Dr. Fermin Calderon, 2, and Garfield, 5. You want to comment? Well, th there are a couple of, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, reasons that, that we're in this situation. One of them I've discussed with the board at length um, and, and that we're following up on. Um, but the other one that I'd like to point out is if we look at Garfield, for example, that has seven, um, uh, I don't know how many years ago because I, I wasn't working in the district at the time, but the district made the decision to close <coughs> Eastside Elementary um, and reshift the enrollment of, of the students. And, and that has impacted where we are now. Uh, so long term, uh, uh, building an additional school might be, a, a, mm -hmm. might be the way to go, but but that certainly uh, lent itself. And then we have seen some increased enrollment that we're addressing. Uh, at Buena Vista, if we look at the fourth grade classes, a few years ago, uh, when the schools didn't meet AYP, Buena Vista was one of the schools that they were allowed to transfer to. Uh, so there are transfer students that might live on Qualia Drive, mm -hmm. but drive all the way to Buena Vista. And because of the way the law is written, you cannot terminate their enrollment in the new school because once you grant it, it becomes your permanent place until they choose to not make it so. Uh, now, having said that, I don't believe that uh, once that group of students leaves the school, the problem will be solved because the population is growing, uh, not only with houses, but you also have seen the development of that uh, apartment complex on Highway 90. And that feeds also into one of these. And I couldn't tell you how many school age children live there or will live there in the years to come, but it's not going to make it easier. It's not going to alleviate the problem. Any comments, questions? Or just a comment. I, I know, for example, when Cardwell was at the old Travis campus, it was the flooding, you know, that caused that campus to, I mean, every time it rained, it just flooded the area. And so there was a need to improve. And, and so Cardwell was moved from the Travis site, the old Travis school, right. to east side. But in hopes of also increasing enrollment, because there was no space anymore. It was just portable after portable. And, and I think that that decision provided the results that it was that it desired at the time. It, it, it did do a lot for the pre-K group. Unfortunately, it, it, it also created some future problems that some of which we're experiencing at Garfield. And, um. Right. I think, you know, again, my biggest concern is that when we look across for, you know, homes going up, it's, it's a Buena Vista area and new streets that are opening up. And it's kind of scary, you know, that uh, every time you drive around, you see like, okay, there's a new street opening up right by Buena Vista school, right behind it, two streets actually. And then you look at uh, Lake Ridge and, and you drive down that area and you think that's going to be also an area that feeds into that school. That, yeah, I'm just waiting for the demographic study to be done and, 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 and something big needs to be done like right away. Well, if we went from 20 to 32 from one year to the next, then it's getting to the point to where there needs to be you know, a very definite series of options. Other questions? Okay. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the submission of the 2014-2015 request for maximum class size waiver exception to TEA. Further recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita has motion. Is there a second? 
Mr. Overfelt to second. All in favor by a show of hands. One, two, three. This is unanimous. Motion carries. Agenda item 11B, consideration to approve the waiver of participation in the teacher portal of the Texas Assessment Management System. Michelle Smith. Good evening, Mr. Garvey and Dr. Rios, members of the board. In 2009, the 81st Texas Legislature enacted legislation to provide greater access to student assessment data for students, parents, educators, and the general public. To assist districts in complying with this legislation, TEA developed the Texas Assessment Management System. ANTS was fully operational in October 2011 and complied with the requirements of the Texas Education Code 32.258 as enacted by House Bill 3 in the first legislature. Districts have the option to apply for a waiver of participation in the teacher portal of the Texas Assessment Management System if they have a local data portal that meets those requirements. DMAC, uh, our district student assessment software, meets and exceeds these requirements. Districts interested in fulfilling the requirement of Texas Education Code 32.258 to provide teacher access to, to student assessment data through a local student data system such as DMAC must apply for an expedited waiver from TEA by the end of August. Information regarding this waiver was released December 21st, 2010 through a to the administrator address release. However, we just became aware of the need to apply for a waiver last week through the DMAC homepage. At this, at this time, TEA has confirmed that we can still apply for the waiver and this would be a three-year waiver. Questions on this item? This one's kind of mundane, routine discussion. For the recommendation. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the waiver of participation in the teacher portal of the Texas Assessment Management System. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Any motion to accept? <coughs> Mr. Chavita, or Mr. Overfelt is motion. Mr. Chavita is second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous motion carries. Yes, Ms. Lozano wants to make a statement relative to that item, yes. I guess. Uh, just, I mean, how do we miss a deadline? I mean, in the future, how can we avoid missing a deadline? I know that they've extended it. I mean, you're going to be allowed to submit the waiver. Unfortunately, uh, TA puts out weekly uh, communiques, which we review mm -hmm. diligently on a weekly basis. But Sometimes they're sent to the administrative address, which is very specific. And in this case, we'd have to go back and see who they had on their contact list as the administrator because there wasn't anyone on cabinet that got the letter, and it may have been whoever was in charge of that department three years ago when the waiver was initiated. Can we do that? Absolutely. But, but this is one of those things that don't happen so often, so we, we'll definitely go back and see who. Thank you. Agenda item 11C, consideration approved memorandum of understanding with Southwest Texas Junior College Workforce Training and Development Division in the amount of $8,900 for the CTE Emergency Medical Technician Course Program. Mr. Gonzalez, <coughs> present. Good evening, Mr. Garabudian, Dr. Rios, members of the board. This memorandum of understanding is between San Felipe del Rio CISD and Southwest Texas Junior College. Workforce Training and Development Division for the CTE Emergency Medical Program. The contract includes program coordination, skill instruction, meaning that we will have paramedics assisting our EMT instructor there at the campus, consultation, clinicals, and for this uh, EMT program, they do have to, our students have to go through 30 hours of clinicals. That means that they're spent 24 hours at the ER, six hours in labor and delivery, and they also have to participate in 10 EMS uh, ambulance runs. And certification review, and uh, also the uh, testing fees that are for the EMTB or basic program. The total cost of the program is $8,900 for the school year, and the contract will be paid with the approved state CTE budget. A memorandum of understanding is provided under separate cover for your review. Any questions? 
questions for Mr. Gonzalez? Ms. Lozano has a question. Um, yes, Mr. Gonzalez, just real quickly. The MOU doesn't specifically outline who is going to be coordinate, coordinating directly with the hospital. We do have uh, the Southwest Texas Junior College um, uh, Training and Development Division. We do have a um, person by the name of Luis Gonzalez, which is actually an EMT coordinator that's approved through Southwest Texas Junior College to actually do the coordination. You have to have a state approved coordinator. Right, but that doesn't say that they're going to coordinate with the hospital in the MOU. The, it's my understanding that Southwest Texas Junior College is actually the employer of Mr. Gonzalez. Right, but they just can't walk into the hospital without having someone coordinated. And we have, and uh, I know that Southwest Texas Junior College actually uh, has a uh, agreement with, with the uh, hospital, and this has been ongoing for quite a bit now since we lost our EMT uh, coordinator. Uh, they did uh, get a contract between, and it was actually reviewed through Southwest Texas Junior College and Valverde Regional Medical Center. So that is in place. I think just to clarify, I don't know if it's too late to maybe add that is a bullet as to Southwest Texas Junior College is responsible for that coordination directly with the hospital. Okay. I know there was a question there. I think okay. I had asked you. Yes, I remember we had some dialogue with you about that. I think that just clarifies it and leaves the district out and puts the onus and responsibility where it's been, basically. It's right. just not clear. so that we can go back and we're approving the memorandum with the addition that Ms. Lozano has made and then we'll get to the junior college to see what they need to do with that. Okay. Everybody clear? Yes. Okay, the recommendation. It is a recommendation of the administration and the Board of Trustees to approve the superintendent to sign the memorandum of understanding with Southwest Texas Junior College Workforce Training and Development with a correction noted as with uh, Mrs. Martin, Martinez Lozano. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Mess says motion. Ms. Lozano, a second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing under agenda item 12. That brings us to agenda item 13, business and finance. I have to move the microphone because I'm not sure people hear. <laughs> right now somebody's saying, we can't hear him, and he was complaining about the channel. Agenda item 13. A, consideration to approve investment policy and independent sources of instruction for the training of investment officers. Ms. Valdez. Good evening, Mr. Garavidian, board members. In compliance with CDA legal, all investments made by the district shall comply with the Public Funds Investment Act, which include local statutes. Investments shall be made in accordance with written policies approved by the board. This written policy references CDA local. The board shall review its investment policy and investment strategies not less than annually. Our review uh, was done August of 2013, which was last year. Our last review, I'm sorry. And within 12 months after taking office, the investment officer of the district shall attend at least one training session from an independent source approved by the board. Those sources are included um, in the memo. However, as part of the review of our uh, local investment policy, it was included in your packets, and of course it is also available on our website under board policy. And also included in your packets are the res is the resolution that was approved uh, May 2013, uh, where we designated the superintendent and the chief financial officer as the district's investment officer. And we also included uh, our current certificates uh, verifying our training. Now, if it is the preference of the board, I can take you through each section of CDA local um, to review the areas of compliance. Um, we're in compliance with each area, but just to expand and share with you how we are in compliance with CDA local. And then uh, afterwards, we could recommend any changes. 
I can uh, share with y'all that I did review several other school districts and our policies are almost identical. It's there. I mean, the only change that we have that another to another school district is last year, um, Mr. Richard Long, who we've been working with uh, reviewing our investments, had identified some investment strategies that he felt would be a future credit risk and requested or proposed uh, that we remove those items. We've never invested in those items, so he just felt that that would be one of the areas that we could change. Um, but as I mentioned, all of the other areas that are in our policy, if you open up any other school district, it, the wording is exactly the same. And I share that just uh, so that you're aware that we're not completely outside of any ranges of what other school districts are doing. But again, if it is the, if it is the preference of the board, we can go through each area of CDA local uh, so that I can identify our, how we're in compliance. Your preference, I know this is something that in the finance committee, right? It did. Yeah. So I don't know about the rest of it. Let's talk about the internal controls. You yes, sir. You and I were talking about that at the finance committee. Yes, sir. At the finance committee, we, uh, I did share with the finance committee that we do have internal controls that are written. However, they're not electronic. And at this time, uh, well, not at this time, but within the last couple of months, we've been working on the process of making them electronic. Um, our, it is a requirement of our auditors to review our internal com controls and confirm to the board that we are in compliance with those controls. And our auditors did present that at our January board meeting where he felt our internal controls were very strong and that we were in compliance. However, they're not electronic. And that was something, um, as, as me and Ms. Douglas were reviewing things over the summer, we identified that didn't need to become electronic. But it is a very old binder with just notes written in it as to how processes are established, of course, to be in compliance with separation of transaction of duties, avoidance of collusion, custodial safekeeping, um, Again, all of those areas are, all of the areas in CDA local, we are in compliance, and it is reviewed in depth by our, by our auditors. Yes, sir. Okay, so what, what are our options? You're requesting approval, right? It uh, could also be tabled <coughs> to the next meeting without any undue If, if we would not be out of compliance, um, if we were to table it to wait to complete the uh, electronic version of our internal controls. Now this is a review of our CDA local and any recommendations for changes to CDA local as part of the requirements for CDA legal to review our policy. And as part of uh, CDA legal, um, once we review our policy and the board minutes are approved, which would be at the meeting that uh, follows after we approve a policy, we would then send uh, our CDA local to uh, all of the uh, entities that we use to invest with so that they can then return our certificate of compliance. So tell me again about the internal controls. They're not electronic. Right? No, sir. It, they're just typed up in a binder somewhere. They are. I would. They are typed up, but they're mainly notes written in a binder as to processes that we that were established. Uh, several. I'm sorry. Okay. They're typed in a binder, or they're just. They're in a binder type, but modifications have been uh, in writing versus it being modified and updated and having a final version. I couldn't tell you why that process was maintained, but that was um, the the prior auditors and every auditor prior to that had accepted them as written documentation. But the prior auditors had not reviewed that CDA local hadn't been approved in prior years as well. So well, again, you know, we are 
completely in compliance with CDA local and our auditors did review it, but we don't have an electronic version. Because the auditors don't uh, express an opinion on the effectiveness of the district's internal controls, just that they exist. Right? Okay. okay. Right, they, they, they express that they exist, yes. But it would, it would be our preference to have them electronic and to have a version that can be shared and uh, readable. So should our CDA local support that? I mean, I know we don't have it in place now, but I mean, it sounds like you're anticipating that we will have that electronically available soon. Yes, I mean, we could modify CDA local to read electronic. Yes, I mean, that, that can, we can update that. And we are going to move to an electronic Yes, ma'am. Yes. Which would eliminate any, hopefully, any squigglies being added. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. So, all right. So, what, what are you asking for approval of, and how does the the internal controls that are not electronic, right? How does that factor into? Well, the fact that they're not electronic was just um, an area that we identified as an improvement, but it would not place us outside of compliance with CDA local since our, pre our auditors uh, during our 2013 review accepted what we had as uh, written internal controls. And they did communicate to the board that they um, felt that those internal controls were strong and followed. They expressed it verbally uh, when they came to the to the meeting. I'm sorry. Oh. You see, on okay. Uh, I guess that's why I'm confused because on page 76 of the audit, right, where it talks about the independent auditors report on internal controls over financial reporting and on compliance of other matters based on audit of financial statements, it goes on. Planning and performing our audit for the financial statements, we consider the district's internal control or financial reporting, internal control in parentheses, to determine the audit procedures that are appropriate in the circumstances for the purpose of expressing our opinions on the financial statements, but not for the purpose of expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of the district's internal control. Accordingly, we do not express an opinion on the effectiveness of the district's internal control. What do you all want to do? I mean, do you want to table it and see them in writing and then come back, or do you want to approve it? They're asking for approval. Yeah. Do we have to do it today? That, that's kind of, that's, I think, what I'm asking. I mean, so let's go ahead and table this it. This is a reflection on you. I mean, I just want everybody to know. And, and sir, that's why I mentioned it mm -hmm. at yeah, our she finance did. She committee meeting. She brought this meeting. up in the finance committee. That's why I want mm -hmm. everyone to understand kind of where we are. Here's a possibility, right, of just strengthening it a little bit more. So if it is tabled, because I don't want everyone to come back and say, oh, well, we tabled it, and now look at the bind we're in. So if we tabled it till... Can I express something? Go ahead. I, I think as long as the process is in place, that it, it will be, you know, um, revamped to include, you know, not the notes, handwritten notes or typed up notes, but the way that you would like to see it improve, which is going to be, you know, what is mentioned here, that it will be done electronically. As long as the process is in place, I'm okay with voting it tonight. I think the, the fact that we get a first rating every year, you know, just says that things are being done the way they should be done. But uh, if that area is, you know, one area that needs improvement and the process is in place, I'm okay with it. So we can do either of two things, right? I can ask for a motion to table, because when it comes to $70, $80 million revenue and fund balance, I myself would like to be extremely, extremely cautious. That's why I'm interested in what the audit says as far as internal control. So we can try that. We can try to pass it I mean, as it pleases the board. That's why I just want to make sure if it is tabled, coming back in a month doesn't create undue problems. We can work through it. That is correct. We would not be out of compliance. Okay. Ms. 
Um, I, I did note on the CDA local, it was issued on 9 13 2013. A year ago. 2013? Right. Uh huh. Right. So you said we've never done this, and is that because this is a new policy for us? Because it doesn't say this is, this is, it was issued. issued. It's not an update. It doesn't say revised yeah. or updated. It's not a new policy. It was in place. However, I, I, I couldn't answer why it wasn't brought to the board on an annual basis as part of a compliance. I think that just goes back to something that the board has discussed before, which is it's time to probably go Through policy. policy by policy and make sure we're... And yeah. on our... Uh, we have set up a district... Per Dr. Rose, we've set up our district matrix where... We review all our policies, and we've identified items that require review and, and would be mandated for review, and we've placed them on our calendar. Our finance calendar has every board policy that's linked to any item that has an upcoming deadline or anything that has a review. So we, we, I mean, we are very uh, careful in those areas. Why it wasn't happening before, I couldn't answer that question, but... Uh, we are being very careful in those areas. Every training that we've attended, anything that they've identified that should be happening, we have ensured that we are in compliance. So when that was I when we went to our training that was identified, we immediately brought this to the board last August. I just wasn't sure if you were trying to interject. Or I think that in terms of, of the internal controls, we definitely have an area there that we just need to address. But as it relates to the policy that we're approving tonight, uh, I guess I would just suggest to the board recommend that we focus on improving upon the internal controls and just realize that in terms of, of everything else that we're asking here, specifically um, the sources of instruction for training on the investment officers and the poli policy itself, that uh, unless I miss something in our discussion, that's somewhat separate from the internal controls, and I would rather that we focus on the internal controls um, and update the board uh, on the progress that we make with them. Well, the recommendation is going to be to approve the investment policy. If the investment policy is not accurate, then we can't really do that. Well, it's not, it's not that it's inaccurate, because what it states is a system of internal controls shall be established and documented in writing. And, well, it is in writing. It's in writing. It's we just said it. Yeah. So it's just All we're doing is clarifying. transferring them into an electronic document and making sure that we have some that are typed, we have some that are scribbled, putting them all in, not changing anything to it, uh, but, but codifying them in a consistent manner. Right, and it'll still be in writing, but it'll be electronic. electronic. It'll be digital. Shareable. Basically. Yes. Especially the so shareable part. it's just part. clarifying that little bit. Right, absolutely. So right. that's why I'm saying that we focus on the internal controls um, and how we're presenting them. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we would be changing, and if we would, well, then we would definitely communicate that. But because we're going to be in compliance either way, we're okay with it. I, I would just, I, I, I guess because I know the work that, that they're doing in terms of budget, and this is just one thing that we have to do. The internal controls is, is something related but apart from it. Mm -hmm. I'm just asking a question for clarification. As part of the audit, mm -hmm. is the auditor required to ensure that we've been doing this annually? And if so, and they didn't catch that, then well, that's why the, we have new auditors. Well, now, okay. see, here's the audit before last yeah. year's audit, and they mentioned that we do that. They mentioned the same. Okay. In fact.
this is from the audit from two years ago, 2012. So this is the previous audit. Mm -hmm. um, page 68, report on internal control over financial reporting on compliance, same as the other. Our consideration of internal control over financial reporting was for the limited purpose described in the first paragraph of this section and was not designed to identify all deficiencies in internal control over financial reporting that might be deficiencies, significant deficiencies, or material weaknesses. We did not identify any deficiencies in internal control or financial reporting that we consider to be material weaknesses mm -hmm. as defined above. And then it, yeah. However, <coughs> providing an opinion on compliance was not an objective or all. Yeah. So they exist, right? Yes, sir, they exist. Mm -hmm. And what I was referencing as uh, to the areas that were not reviewed by the auditors was that CDA local itself be presented uh, annually at a board meeting and request approval to document review. Mm -hmm. It's the same verbiage, like says my mm -hmm. uh, paragraph previous. Accordingly, we do not express an opinion on the effectiveness of the mm -hmm. district's internal control over financial reporting. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you want to do? Bring the recommendation and you can vote it up or down. Okay, now okay. let me go back to the recommendation. Now in the recommendation, just to uh, continue, we also have included the independent sources of instruction that it refers to in CDA legal that must be approved by the board. Um, we have identified six uh, different agencies. Um, four of them we have used. The reason we have included all six is just for availability of when they actually uh, conduct their trainings and when it works with our schedule. But for example, um, Region 20 was where um, this past year um, Ms. Douglas and myself went for the training. And then at Taza Tasby, uh, two years ago, Ms. Douglas and I went for uh, and attended the training under Taza Tasby. And then um, Dr. Rios uh, also attended, used the University of North Texas uh, Center for Public Management to attend their training. Again, it's just uh, based on availability. And uh, these are sources, uh, the only, these are sources that we have used and that's why we've included them all, because of the availability. But uh, if, then I can read the recommendation. It is a recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the investment policy and independent sources of instruction for the training of the investment officers. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita's motion, Mr. Mesa has second. All in favor by a show of hands. <coughs> one, two, three, four, five. In favor, one opposed. And merely because I would like to have seen the internal controls complete and typed and then we bring it back. Thank you. Motion carries. So when will we see the electronic finished internal controls? I We hope to get them completed within the next month. Okay. If any issue arises, we'll immediately let you know. Okay. So possibly we could get that as an update at the next regular board meeting or maybe even sooner in a board report. As soon as they're ready, we'll provide a board report. And yeah. if, if for whatever reason they can't be done within 30 days, we'll, yeah. we'll yeah. let you know. Because as a board, as a governing board, we're, we're really at a whim of those controls because the auditors don't take responsibility. They just simply say they exist, right? So, yes. And from an administration standpoint, they're guaranteeing that they put them in place. Ultimately, it comes on us if they're not adequate or accessible or fully understood. The policy is in place. Mm -hmm. It only needs to be in addition to it, right. which will be electronic. So, okay, so I look okay. forward to it in about a month or maybe sooner. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, agenda item 13B, consideration of approved disposal of surplus furniture slash personal. Is that right? Personal or personnel? Is that supposed to be personal? Personal property. Personal property during the 2014-15 fiscal year. Good evening, Mr. Garavidian, Dr. Rios, and board members. Uh, in compliance with Texas Education Code 11151 and board policy CI Local, I come to you tonight to ask for your approval for the disposal of surplus technology equipment, surplus furniture, personal property. 
back uh, last year in July of 2013, Mr. Casillas brought before you for the 13-14 school year your approval to go enter into a contract with Technology Exchange for the disposal of our technology equipment once it's been cannibalized and they have utilized all of the parts of the computers that they can use for repair locally um, and also for AV equipment. And so I'm asking tonight if you will extend that uh, RFQ 1401 for this school year for the disposal of technology equipment if it becomes necessary and also to ask for your approval for a quarterly or an as needed or, at, or as needed surplus sales throughout the district for furniture etc that has been uh, retired or has been dis the campuses are wanting to dispose of it because it's no longer usable. Any surplus furniture, AV equipment, anything like that that we pick up that has been retired by a campus or an office, it's offered to other employees and campuses within the district before we actually put it on surplus property. And once we've done that, if nobody's interested and nobody wants it, and most of the time they don't because once it's disposed of, it's <laughs> You know, it's really um, not desired or used or usable. Uh, then we put it on surplus sale, and we advertise in the newspaper, and we post it on the website, the, all of the information on the sale. So I come to you tonight to ask for your approval for us to continue using technology exchange and to approve our holding surplus sales on an as-needed basis. Having the sales quarterly has really helped us not to have to end up being a storage unit for the school district. You know, we had like four or five different locations that were just piled with old furniture that nobody wanted. And with, in y'all's approval of having quarterly sales, it's really narrowed that down. So are there any questions? Questions? Okay. All right, if not, it's the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the disposal of surplus furniture slash personal property during the 2014-2015 physical year, either quarterly or on an as-needed basis. For the recommendation, I so move to accept. Is there a second? Ms. Lozano has second. All in favor, by a show of hands. Unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 13C, consideration to approve the appointment of the local school health advisory council members. Uh, Diane Hernandez, is she presenting or is someone else presenting? I don't see her. Is she here? She was listed on the agenda. Yeah, but I don't see her. I guess that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I can't even present. Okay. Mr. Garabedian, Dr. Rios, board members, again, good evening. Um, this is our second year of presenting uh, SHAC members. The advertisement was present was uh, initiated and communications were presented via our district uh, web page. And we do have a list of uh, 14 members. I believe the last two on the list are new. And then we had three exiting members from last year. So a good part of the group that originated last year is still uh, remaining uh, for this year. And um, our First initial meeting is scheduled for October 14th. Okay. I'm, can we do questions? Or yes, sir. Still talking? All right. So, um, I, I saw the list, right, of the names. There's 14 people, I yes, guess sir. it is. And the majority of them are parents. Seven are. Okay. So half are parents with students in the district, and they are not employed by the district. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. The reason I ask, I mean, not to be so obvious about it, but I just saw the names. It, I didn't see that indication. Who's the chair of the committee? Um, I think that would be re-identified at their first meeting, but last year it was Miss Tracy Page. And that's a parent who's not an employee? I don't believe. Uh, well, we have her listed as a parent. She is not an employee. Okay. She's an five parents listed here that are non-employees, I think. One, two, three, five. Right. 
Oh, six, I'm seven. <coughs> six. I have s is there an employee? Because Ms. Torres is, is an employee. By okay, district. I'm sorry. So that is not a majority. Unless number 11, number 12, number 13, number 14 are also parents. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, but I, I think the, the, the purpose is to make sure that school employees aren't the majority. Uh, not necessarily that parents are the majority. So if you look at the members on 14 through 10, they're not employees of the school district. And I thought that was a well, see, I'm looking on page 11. Yeah, so the majority should be parents. It's a strategic tip, right? Yeah, the majority right. of SHAC members must be parents of students enrolled in the district who are not employed by the district. But maybe, but you're right, maybe 11, 12, 13, 14 are parents and are not employed by the district, so it would be okay. Okay, but I don't know that. I don't, I don't yes, I don't have that information right now, if they are parents or not of the district. Of district. Right now, it would be half. Are at least half, right? At That's half. what are we identified. know for a fact. That yes. it's at least oh, I'm sorry, it's six. Right, I keep six thinking the other is seven. Yes. Almost half. Because <laughs> not a majority. Not quite. <laughs> Do, is there a calendar? You know, when, where they meet? They do meet here in the boardroom. But, it, but is there a calendar? I mean, like, is there a... So the 14th is the first meeting. The 14th would be the first meeting, and at that meeting is when they would identify what recurrences of their oh, they could have based on their schedules. could request to move this meeting to um, the following week and after our board meeting of the 20th. We'll, yeah. we'll just move the meeting down to Shack uh, mm -hmm. 10 days later and that way we can bring a, a, a better list. And we apologize. The 20th. Okay. Yes. I, I don't think anybody is expressing lack of support or anything like that. In fact, it's the other. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that parents of mm -hmm. district kids, right, who are not employees are the vast majority. We think they're, I'm saying half. Sassy's arguing saying, no, it's not half. It's six. She's probably well, right. Six of 14 oh, is not half. I wasn't good in math. So she's, okay, she is right. <laughs> so that's all we're doing. I mean, we want to make sure that it's represented the way it should be. It's certainly in yes, no way sir. a reflection on the committee. I think just the opposite, that we want it to be everything that it's supposed to be. And that's why I asked about the calendar, right? When do they, do they know long ahead of time that they meet? you know, every month or whatever it is or every couple of months. and Because it also mentions about it being uh, promoted or published or something. Again, the calendar would be set after their first meeting, okay. but we did, uh, uh, it was at our either July or August board meeting where we presented the letter um, to the board of requesting candidates. We then immediately put it on our website. We shared it, I believe, on Facebook. Okay. We did do promotions. Okay, that's fine. Well, like Ms. Lozano pointed out on the, on the bylaws, so we want to make sure we're mm -hmm. in compliance and the committee is what it's supposed to be and that way is able to do what it's supposed to do. So let's do this. There's obviously a regular coming up in a month, but there's also a, a likelihood that there might be a workshop because on our superintendent evaluation calendar, planning calendar, we try to, to set the instrument in October. So there's a possibility that we could come back prior to the regular meeting, and if that's the case, we could, you know, we could take action on it then. So that might be in two or three weeks rather than a month. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, so motion to table till no later than the next regular meeting, which would be October of 2014. Yes. Is there a second? Ms. Lozano has second. All in favor by a show of hands. It's unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, agenda item 13D.
consideration to approve interlocal agreement with TML, multi-state intergovernmental employee benefits pool due to name change. Uh, Laura English is presenting. Good evening, uh, Mr. Garibaldi and Dr. Rios, members of the board. Uh, under separate cover, you received a copy of the interlocal agreement that we are requesting um, or we're submitting for your approval. Uh, back on uh, May 21st, 2012, the interlocal agreement um, with TML Intergovernmental Employee Benefits Pool was approved. Um, at this time, we are requesting that you approve a new interlocal agreement. Uh, nothing has changed except their name. They have changed now to uh, TML Multi-State Intergovernmental. And uh, for that reason, we are requesting uh, that you approve a new interlocal agreement with them. Okay, I have a question, not to be argumentative, because I'm sure people are thinking this is what I'm doing. I'm looking at the 2009 agreement, and I did read them, but I did notice that there is a difference, and I think the difference is probably because the name change is also a corporate change. Like, for example, on the 2009 agreement, right, there are 14 points, but on the 2014 agreement, there are 16. So if there's no changes to the contract, these 15 and 16, is it because this is now a multi-state corporation? Because it seems to be referencing on 15, which doesn't exist on the original contract that it's entered into the state of Texas and understood in green Paw and so on. So why that difference? review it during the finance committee. The verbiage is very similar, but right. it is updated to what their new multi-state okay. contract is. But so the verbiage is very similar. Yes. Yeah. No, but no, 15 that's, and 16 is new. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I read, one through, I read 1 through 14 mm -hmm. of the original, and then the new one, and yeah, it's the same. The 15 and 16 is added. So that's solely because they are now a multi-state multi corporation, as opposed so. to a Questions? Okay. There's no questions. I won't say anything. Okay. Recommendation. It is the recommendation of the administration that the Board of Trustees approve the interlocal agreement with TML Multi State Intergovernmental Employee Benefits Pool. For the recommendation, is there a motion to accept Mr. Overfelt his motion, Ms. Haynes a second? All in favor by a show of hands, unanimous, motion carries. Thank you. The table to the next item, sir. What's that? By the table to the next item to the next board meeting. Very good, because I had questions on that, too. <laughs> I just, we will table it. I just want to ask, on agenda item 13E, <coughs> when I looked at it, um, did I see it correctly that... Um, Critical needs assistant. What is that? Yeah. Critical needs assistant. Nurse. Okay. Is seven twenty-five an hour? Yet we pay student aid slash MEEP students. What is that? Critical needs is a shadow. Hmm. The critical, the critical needs, needs is a shadow. shadow. Okay. What is this? This here. Student aids. MEEP students. Uh, we have. Students. Student workers. Yes. So they're paid eight dollars an hour, and the CNA is seven twenty-five. Is that right? That's not a CNA. Or critical needs assistant. No, that's the same. I mean, that's, okay. Well, that's C what they C call CNA it. Tam, critical needs assistant, right? Um, mm -hmm. Am I reading that correctly? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. We want to table it for further analysis, comparison to last year's stipends. There's some corrections that we identified. I think we ought to table it. I don't like those. Yeah. The, the, I, I, my intention was to question those things and to table it. He's already saying that for whatever reason they want to table it to bring it back. So. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Overfelt has motioned to table this item. And when are we tabling it to? Just to the next meeting. All right. To be tabled to the next regular board meeting, which is October of 2014. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Unanimous motion carries.
Okay, nothing on agenda item 14, nothing on agenda item 15. Okay. It is now 8.42 p.m. September 15th, 2014, and the Board of Trustees will recess this open session and convene the closed meeting in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, Subchapter D&E. Did I say the date correct? Yes, sir. I did? Okay. Subchapter D&E, call out, and call out the specific sections. We're able to do that under Sections 551.071, 551.072. 551.073, Specifically tonight, pursuant to 551.074, discussion of personnel to hear complaints against personnel. First item being discussion of personnel report to include the following. New hires, district vacancies, retirements, resignations. And two, discussion of salary adjustments to include, but not limited to the following justifications, matrix salary adjustments, service credit, master's degree. All final votes, actions, or decisions will be taken in open session. We're now in closed session. Okay, it's now 9.30 p.m., September 15, 2014, and the Board of Trustees will now reconvene in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, Subchapter D&E. No action was taken in closed session. We are now reconvened to open session. Agenda item 17 brings us to A, consideration to approve the personnel report. We include the following, new hires, district vacancies, retirements, resignations. Dr. Petty. Good evening, Mr. Garabini and members of the board and Dr. Rios. The administration at this time proudly recommends the following new hires this evening for your consideration. Lorena Guzman, fourth grade bilingual teacher, Buena Vista Elementary. Maria Letty Gutierrez, first grade teacher, Buena Vista Elementary. Jennifer Sandoval, English teacher, Del Rio Middle School. Miss Elizabeth Hansen, Spanish teacher, Del Rio Middle School. And Miss Elda Garcia, our ESL strategist for the bilingual ESL district program. Okay, we've heard the recommendations. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Overfelt is motion. Miss Haynes is second. All in favor by a show of hands. One, two, can you come on? One, two, three, four. Mr. Chavia, you voted five in favor. All opposed? One opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item 17B, consideration of approved salary adjustments to include the following justifications, matrix salary adjustments, service credit, master's degree. Dr. McManero. I'll be making the recommendations, sir. Okay, and I have two Dr. Recommendations. The first recommendation is the recommendation of the administration. The, we approve the one salary adjustment for the master's degree as discussed in closed session. We've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? Ms. Lozano has motion. Mr. Chavita has second. All in favor by a show of hands. Mm -hmm. Unanimous. Motion carries. Next. Mr. President, is the recommendation of the administration that the board approve the administrative matrix realignment as discussed in executive session? <coughs> closed session. We've heard the recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? Mr. Chavita has motion. Mr. Mesa has second. All in favor by a show of hands. One, two, three, four. All opposed? Two opposed. Motion carries. Agenda item 18, superintendent's report. Nothing to report. Being no further business before this board. Agenda item 19, adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Ms. Haynes has motion. Mr. Overfelt is second. All in favor by a show of hands. <laughs> Unanimous. Motion carries. Yes, everybody wants to go home. Thank you. We are adjourned.